Hey everybody, Rule the Lions UK, Matt, Tom, Ash and guest Chris. We are all here, we're just waiting for Ant and Ryan to join us as well. So we're just chatting while we're getting set up. How you doing boys? Um, okay. hmm, interesting, interesting question, I guess. Oh, I hate it, I hate <laughs> it so much. Ah, uh, what's up? It's not, yeah, it's. it's like who are we gonna well we're gonna raid you after this but like who are we gonna raid now like mm. yeah it's a fantastic question and one i wish i had more answers to especially since um uh, a lot of it's up in the air right now i'm not going to speak for everyone from the former pride of detroit pod cast uh it has been uh, a bit of a wild weekend i also work over weekends as well so i basically went through the process of just being flame burned out as hell um it's been uh something to say the least we'll go with something <laughs> tom you sold your house today today i think it was yeah li literally today um which is cool terrifying exciting all of those things all at once but as i was just saying slightly off air it does look like i'm in the darkest room imaginable which i'll try and fix for next time but you know for now we'll run with it you look like you're on the way to Hades or something. I don't know. Like... <laughs> Maybe. Maybe that's a look into the future. Crossing the river sticks. <laughs> How you doing, Ash? I'm doing all right, doing all right. I had a bit of a concern at the weekend, thought I broke my finger playing flag football. Thankfully, we have not. I've still got my five fingers on my left hand, but it's just looking very bruised. But other than that, just excited to talk draft. And then obviously me and Matt, two weeks away, we'll be there. I, I, I'm boots on the ground covering things like uh, live while well, everyone else kind of hides that holes down the fort over here. Then you fail brag that you're one of the few people in Birmingham who have five <laughs> fingers, but never mind. <laughs> Ryan, how you doing, mate? Yep, good, thank you. Yep, good. Smash my draft. Like I said, I already know that. I don't need people to tell me that. How you doing, Chris? You all right? I, I have something to say about mock drafts, but I'm going to save it for when we go live mm. because um, uh, it, it, it goes to my philosophy. Well, I spoiler, I man, I don't know how anyone does a seven round mock draft without just talking out your fucking ass. And I don't believe anyone who says they know anything about anything past day two. Like once oh. you get outside the top 100, it's Jover. You, you have not listened to Ant and Ryan on the college show very much. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure they think they know what they are, but like I, uh, I think I think I know nothing. That is not an insult to them. It's just saying this entire industry, I believe, is just way too. I I kind of went into this on on my farewell piece. I think this entire industry has been way too much about like blog blogging and podcasting have been way too much about. This is information. We're giving you just a spigot of information. I'm like that's cool, but like I. I tell people I had some people talk to me about this, about like, why do you do 15 minute segments? Why do you do 20 minute segments? It's like this all comes from me doing radio. Like I grew up loving and sports talk radio was in a very specific place. I know for a lot of people in Detroit, that's always tainted by 97.1. And I'm not here to shit on 97.1. I think those guys do a fantastic job with what they're given. Radio in Detroit has a very long history. 97.1 is, was just one piece of it. Um, but like when I was getting into this, I was listening to basically the golden age of ESPN radio, which started in the mornings with Mike and Mike, which was such a powerhouse that it probably had an ad adverse relationship on radio in this country because every local station out there shut down their morning shows because Mike and Mike was just so damn successful. People wanted to listen to Mike and Mike. It wasn't my cup of tea, but people wanted Mike and Mike, Mike Greenberg and Mike Golick. It was a juggernaut. It reshaped radio. And then you had Colin Cowherd who goes up in that pantheon with guys like Jim Rome and Mike Francesa and Mag Dog Russo as like one of the most powerful solo names in sports. Now, might not know a ton about sports, but presents them very well and makes them digestible. Again, not my cup of tea. But then, then you had Scott Van Pelt doing radio. 
Ryan Rosillo doing radio. You had Dan Lebitard before they kicked him off the air. Bomani Jones for a while. And still one of my favorite people on ESPN radio, Freddie Freeman, who has been there forever, finally gets he's getting time off the late nights. But he was always a voice I would listen to late nights. Just smooth, groovy guy just laughing about these stories of the day. But that was radio. That was sports talk radio to me. That was impressive. That was fun. And it taught me that this wasn't just an exercise for meatheads, that there was something cool about it. And that's always what I wanted to do with the POD cast. So like when people chide me about the lack of information, that's that's fine. I could probably stand to do more prep in the end of the day. But like that is the most important thing. It's not just what you have to say. It's can you break it down for someone who knows nothing about the sport and make it cool and fun? That unfortunately leads us to stuff that people rail about, like takes hot takes and 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 lesser analysis. But that is the price we pay for reaching more people. That's the price we pay that it's not just a small closed circle. And I feel like things like the Reddit, and again, not to shit on Reddit, but the Redditification of things makes that really hard. It makes it hard because people think that the more information you have, the stronger you should be. And that's not the case. That's never been the case. In the real world, that doesn't work. Just because you are you have the most information doesn't give you like power over everyone else. And I've just I've always railed against that. I've always railed against this idea because I certainly don't have time to sit down and do a Ron Jaworski impression. Now, I don't think anyone does. <laughs> I think we can bullshit our way through it. And I'm going to do that for seven rounds. Love it. Love it. And I haven't seen you in a football chat before on the show. I don't think. I do occasionally. What is that there? What is I, I'm not familiar with all crests yet. Oh, this is Chesterfield. So we're a Oh Chesterfield, wonderful. We're soon to be a fourth tier team again, but we're fifth at the minute. So I think wait, that was I mentioned. I I've fallen in love with the what is that? The price of football podcast? Who runs that? Yeah. Kevin uh I've fallen in love with those two on their podcast. And I Kieran McGuire. Yeah, and I think they have mentioned I think Chesterfield was a conversation at one point on there. I actually don't know that podcast, so I will have to listen to it. It's very good. Kira McGuire and uh, Kevin Hunter Day. It's um, it's like it's one of the most famous football podcasts out there. Really, price of it's, football. I just it's, don't listen to football podcasts. It's 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 very it's very granola. It's very much the exactly what I was just talking about. Like it is the uh, economics of football. It is the it's kind of like especially their favorite topics tend to be clubs that are constantly um, in crisis, like Wigan. Um, talk about uh, I, yeah they yeah. they they talk about. They, they talk about basically the health of the ecosystem of English football, which I find a lot of I was talking with a friend of mine about this, and I, I, I share a lot of empathy towards towards that subject just because I feel it really reflects the current state of college football in this country. It hasn't hit that rot point yet, but like this new era of untethered NIL is going to reach it very soon. There's a mm. lot of universities are already in economic trouble like i don't know what the fuck happens to ucla i don't like like and that's a uc school and ucla is like i don't know how they're still running football i genuinely do not understand how they still have a football program that's pretty scary that's very yeah. scary Find that podcast. if it's all about doom and gloom and football like that's my whole life <laughs> like, <laughs> like a miserable football team uh, all their own. So that's what my uh, like. Uh, just want to give Did a shout. Out. The eclipse at all? Oh yeah, sorry. Go no, on. no, no, no. Uh, eclipse not here. It's only North America, oh, I think. Oh, uh, is it yes. Mexico, US, Canada? I think something. It misses yeah. California completely. It's going over my hometown of Toledo almost directly. So my mom and my her boyfriend are getting uh, shades right now. I was on a flight to the US last week and one of the guys I was traveling with was sitting next to some eclipse chasers and literally all they do is go mm. around the world trying to like chase eclipses. They were cool. some unique people, I'll say that, but they were pretty good fun. So never heard of that. Heard of tornado chasers, never yeah. eclipse chasers. That's... What, what what's this something that everyone's talking about? What what is it? <laughs> Chesterfield <laughs> definitely don't see the sun. You say well, you know, I well, mean 
It's, it's Here's done the thing. Not but rain for the last fortnight. I don't know what. I don't know what that nice shine. Rain thing in, in the England? Sky is. Are you rain in rain in the in in Great Britain? Hmm. It's what we're famous. It's what we're famous. Imagine for. that meme of Mourinho saying, "If I speak, I'm in trouble." Eclipse chases. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just know I mean, that uh, we we do, we do know that Mike Florio is not among their number. That's for sure. Oh, Mike Florio! I, I've had enough of pro football talk. I really have. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the people who are joining us, especially the guys who are here supporting Chris. Did really I appreciate really you guys. Yet? Hold on, being here as well. Shit, I need to read uh, it. People subscribing on Twitch, Joshua Mercer Seven for your ninth month. Cheers, Josh. Uh, Carolyn Wu, who I know is a Pride of Detroit listener, first time chatter, thank you very much. Quirky Zerky, first time I've seen you in a little while, my man. I know you're active on the Pride of Detroit Discord, was Pride of Detroit Discord. We're calling it We're, something else uh, now. I'm, What's it going to be called, I'm workshopping. <laughs> I'm workshopping ideas. I'm thinking about calling it Lion's Tiki Bar, um, which was a joke I had to explain to my lone moderator for a second until it slowly dawned on him, Honolulu Blue. Um, and uh, probably in honor of this thing. Love I've it. taken a loving of uh, tiki bar drinks lately. Uh, Kingston uh, clubs, uh, Singapore slings, Mai Tais, and best of all, Hurricanes. Oh, wow. I had just a sling. I've never heard of that. It's a uh, gin drink. It's a gin drink. Yeah, and it ooh. actually is one of the few. I like it. But um, man, once I start drinking two, I start smelling the gin. And that's, so, I never want to smell the gin. No. So, given that you're a bit of a jet setter, Tom, at some point you'll uh, go to Singapore, I'm sure. And the hotel there, the famous hotel, was called Raffles. And that's where that drink was created. Yes. And when I went there with my parents when I was 14, we were staying in the Plaza Hotel, which is like the sister shit hotel mm -hmm. compared to the real thing. And they just abandoned us most evenings to go and have Singapore slings in the hotel. And I was like, yeah, it's mostly like boring. gin. <laughs> it's mostly like gin, cherry liqueur, a little bit of like curacao or contro, and yeah. like there's like one more little bit of herbal in there and some juices, and yeah, yeah. Okay, it's very good, very good. I am about uh, rum punches at the moment, but I had a hurricane rum on punch Saturday. Is fantastic. And I'm like, oh yes, love it. Uh, I can't have a hurricane without thinking about uh, Jimmy Buffett and Alan Jackson. My dad grew up huge into Jimmy Buffett, so this is probably the DNA hitting home. Uh, hello to Jill, who's in the Twitch chat as well, with her Lions fan. We've also got Dan Pask subscribing at Tier 1 for his 25th month, says have a great mock go Lions. Who else have we got in here to uh, YouTube? Bailey in the chat from the Chicago Bears fandom. We'll see you at the draft. I think we're going to meet up for a beer. Looking forward to it. Carlton Wood, Dan Mack, Brent DeWitt, Asher in there too. So is Anne. Stephen Collins. See you soon, buddy. Um, Lisa DiLorenzo. M40 saying, no, won't say that. Ellie Soden. Uh, DMAP Zoom. And Teardrop Floyd. Welcome, everyone. If you want a shout out, come say hello. We are talking Mock Draft. I want to change the name of the show because I hate it. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to change it. Mockingham Palace is just shit. Um, I... <laughs> oh. I've not seen it, but... I was going to say, I didn't see that either. <laughs> it's kind of, it's so shit. That it kind of works. <laughs> it's good. It's, I just want to say, so like, it's, it's good. so bad. <laughs> you, you, you listen. You, you. If you play to some some Americans, you always have to play it up a little bit. They just like it's it's certain things we expect. I mean, the whole yeah. eclipse of the sun god right now is just it's not relevant, but it's just so relevant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to be fair, it, yeah, like the lines Twitter account even played into it with the uh, played into the Michael Jordan "You Are My Sunshine" meme as well. So it was like a three and one. What about total eclipse of the heart then? Just Total eclipse of the heart. <laughs> oh, I like that. Actually, uh, I, I absolutely like clip that and just make sure we have that in there. Yeah. I absolutely yeah, live I for do. making Anne make that face that's happening right now. Look at that. <laughs> you need, Listen, I, I, I'm going to miss the karaoke it's strings it'll, it'll, more it'll, than anything. It'll, it'll not be as bad as your mock draft compared to mine. So, you know, it's not oh. the worst thing on here today. But I, oh. Firstly, I love this because all of you are getting competitive saying you smashed your mocks. My mock is awful, but it's awful for a oh, reason, yeah, which we'll get to. Oh, yeah, same. <clears> I've <throat> just picked a lot of people I that I like. I'm just like, I'm getting a blue tick. 
Uh, you know that no, meme where it's like the dog, surprised. that that dog who's dressed up in the lab coat with the gla with the safety gla goggles, saying, "I yeah. have no idea what I'm doing." That's that's basically what I did here after about um, after about two or three picks. That's rough. Anyway, actually, there is there is a method to it, but um, <laughs> there is a method to my madness, um, and it 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 is um, it rhymes with Athcom. And uh, I'm just gonna roll. Oh with no! It. Oh no! Oh no! And prepare yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to this very, very much. Right. <laughs> Thanks to Chris as well. <laughs> oh no, he's gone. No decaf. Go and uh, go and subscribe to No Decaf. Who I think Chris, are you gonna stream after us? Uh, I think so. Um, I'm kind of expecting this like guy to walk in the door and maybe fix my fridge. It's been a week, week but um, I think I was going to take it easy today, but I think just for the sake of um, old time appearances, I'll be live for at least a few hours just to take some take some uh, questions. Usually this is my day where I prep a lot of like D&D &D stuff as well. Um, Sorry, I'm just getting a weird text. Uh, but yeah, I think this is all coincided with me not being worked to a stub at my other job. So there's definitely going to be more no decaf streams in the future. I might need to change the name of that to something a little more professional. But I I don't want us to splinter off too much until we can bring people back around together. And I know we control the POD Twitch. But uh, yeah, that's still my personal stream. Mm. Yeah. All right. And are you there? There we go. He's back. Are we ready to go? Yep. Oh my god, we got another one. And it's Pride of Detroit saying here for Twitch's best and brackets and only lines page. Oh no. Oh, oh no. Oh. Oh. I don't like it. I don't like it. Listen, oh. we're we're still I, I'm still going to be back at some point for the late night um I don't know if I'll be live day three now just because um, I need to take the money on the weekends, but um, I'm sure I'm going to pop in day two when it's like hyper late, super early for you guys drinking my ties. So we'll keep doing that. I'm, I'm presuming draft. you're staying I'm... in California or are you in Detroit? Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I'm in, I'm in California. I'm in California. I don't, our, our own plans for a live show kind of fell through a while back. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then this happened. So, I mean, yeah, I'm, as much as I'd like to be live for day three, now with this, I'm not one to turn down any work from Fox Sports Radio right now. No, that um, makes sense. Yeah. To be sure. To be sure. All right, let's get going with this. Mm. Recording in progress. Welcome to another edition of the Royal Lands UK podcast, episode 263, Mock the Cowspar. My name's Matthew Turner, alongside... Ashley Soden, Ryan McCluskey, Anthony Fitzpatrick, Tom Wilkinson, and with special guest, the more than adequate host, Chris Perfett. Chris, how you doing, buddy? I'm not the host of anything anymore. That's the worst part. Like, I, I graduated beyond adequate. I still like that word adequate, but like, I'm not, I'm, what am I hosting right now? I, I, I'm a guest. I'm an adequate guest is what I am right now. Thank you guys for having me. This has um, been a wild week. For those who uh, are familiar with my work, um, I've been exhausted. I've not been sleeping well. Um, I've been stressed. I've had juggling this with work and everything. But uh, I love nothing more than coming on here and pretending like I know who is going to go for pick 249 for the Detroit Lions. I, I think I think that allows me to feel fake. And I love nothing more that, than right now to not show my real self and to appear someone else. Thank you. You guys have always been good to us at, from the Pride of Detroit POD cast. I like to think that uh, I I always can come in here and just bullshit with you guys. And uh, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. We love having you on. And thank you for the shout out on the show, on on the last show that was, because that was totally unexpected. Because I don't think we do anything special, but appreciate it. And hey, it's going to be great to just chew the fat with you. I, I, I talked about it, though, on the first podcast we did that I guested with you guys, the one where like my power cut out and I ended up <laughs> doing it from a janky Wi-Fi in what was the old studio used by Nikki Six of Motley Crue during his ill-fated uh, radio show. And that was that 
I am a big believer in the global growth of the National Football League and American football. I think it is my, it is my, I, I don't think, I know it is my favorite sport. I know I will watch it at every level. I know I spent some time over this weekend watching the UF freaking L. And like, I, I, I believe that when a sport is able to energize the entire globe, not just America, and that inspires people from not just America to play the game and to watch the game and have fun watching a sports event it benefits everyone it it is a magical magical thing it's one of the things i loved the most when i was younger and discovered the world cup it's what i loved when i found out about the world baseball classic and for god's sakes i want more people to love the nfl because it is a fantastic sport it is a wonderful sport and you guys fulfill that mission and i love supporting what you guys do in that on because of that Appreciate that. Um, talking to someone who absolutely knows what they're talking about when it comes to pick 249, no matter how much Chris may protest that fact, Anthony Fitzpatrick, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing good, thanks. Hope everybody here is doing well. This is it's the fun part now, isn't it? When you get to the mock draft shows, you know the draft is near, which is the good thing. It's been quite good this year because draft season has been short, you know, because the line stuff was so late. I don't feel as fatigued this time. I still feel quite energized. We'll do our mocks, then the draft comes. It's it's all great. Love, love I'm life. I'm I'm fatigued, mostly from the national side because um I think we all know who's going like one, two, three in this draft, or at least one and two. And it's just people are just tittering about the rest of the way. I have no idea who's going to. I'll just say that now. I've got absolutely no idea. I let me put it this way. If Jaden Daniels goes to Washington, they are not beating the they're just football. They're just basketball guys charge that Ben Johnson leveled against them. Mm. Yeah, they're no, not. I, oh, they're no. not beating that charge. No, it, it, it's it's Drake May or or I riot. And I don't even care about the commanders. And Ryan, you're getting a blue check mark at the end of this. I hear. If I predict someone between. Uh double digits and triple digits then yeah i'll crown myself with blue tick i say how, 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 how much is that how much is that in the british pound is it is it 10 pound a month six nine and a month something for the basic or something okay seven pounds the, the us dollar is worth more than the pound now oh uh no how much is it in dollars eight it's like eight dollars seven in pounds so there are the pounds. Oh, okay 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 there we go Oh, Buckeye and MI asking me to hydrate. Okay. There we go. Tom, how you doing, buddy? I'm great. This is by far the least prepared I've been for any draft cycle pretty much since I've been a fan. And I've never got any picks right in a mock. So I feel like this is going to be the turning point. The less I know, the luckier I get, something like that. Um, my mock draft spoiler is going to be an absolute disaster. And as a result, I'm expecting every pick to be completely right. Which I but think that's is reasonable. good. I think you've got to go in with that level of confidence, right? Makes the rest of us feel smarter, Tom, because, you know, we all know you secretly are the good one at this, so. Stop it. Ash, how are you, mate? I'm all right, just trooping on. Le Leveling the, as Chris said, the global experience of the game, being the one that fl plays flag football. Le uh, trooping that on, obviously. Gathering injuries by the dozen. Hips, still, hips very dodgy. Hand nearly broken but trooping on to draft season, which is one of my favourite times of the year, because I get to talk about a load of FSU players and you guys can't moan about it. I can Chris, say I that. I loved what you said about international um, mm. kind of following of American football. I think we may, it may be the limit of how much you want to watch it if you're going to come and watch uh, Ash play flag football some stage. But <laughs> I I mean, mean, let's see if uh, we can well, test me... that at some stage. Listen, I we're going to have, if, if this thing does become flag football, we're already in trouble with, the country that birthed it, considering what people in this country think about flag football. <laughs> Once you have a taste of the real, genuine, like rock bone splitting one, it's kind of hard for people to uh, dial that back. I think we'll get there someday, though. I, I know the NFL wants to push flag football as best they can. So we are going to get into a little bit of news before we get into all of our seven round mock drafts. But first, don't forget to join our Discord channel. Link is in the live chat right now. Great place to talk draft. And then lines all the way through the off-season. College Football Podcast, Ant and Ryan, is coming to the end of season number three now, I think. What have you got coming up in our last episode? So we, we've right. got 
A surprise, mm. yeah. A oh. Surprise. Oh. A special draft challenge that we've set oh. ourselves. We're going to attempt to prove that we're smarter than something that might people think might be much smarter than us. So, you know. So basically, it's you versus Chris at this point. <laughs> in some form or fashion. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> That's a good tease. I like it. Go and listen to the guys. Is that this week? Yeah, it'll be on Wednesday. All right. Come Should check be. that out then. Don't forget to like the show. Sub to the podcast. All that good stuff that you can do for us as small content creators. It really does make all the difference. And we also have a merch store. I did promise some extra draft stuff. And frankly, I have not. Apologies. But if you want to get something back for your support for the show, then that's one of the better ways of doing it. Right. News time. Since we last spoke, the Lions matched the offer for Brock Wright from San Francisco, keeping him in Detroit on a three-year deal worth $12 million. The cap hits are funky. Don't believe what you read on over the cap because it's not quite right. I'll explain why now. But effectively, there's an option bonus in year two which isn't accounted for in the cap hits. So you have to work that in as a void year hit as well, which actually has in there. But if the deal works out as it is at the moment, it's going to be 1.75 million in year one, 2.6 in year two, 4.8 in year three, and then 2.7 on a void year in the fourth year. If he's cut after year two, it's going to be 1.75 as it was, 2.6 in year two, and then in the year of cut at the start of year three, it's going to be 3.9 million in the cut year. And then if he's cut after year one, it's 4.6 million as the guarantee. So boys, we uh, we extend the offer to him that he got from San Francisco. And in doing so, we actually save ourselves $1.2 million on the cap compared to the tag that we put him on. So I know that it seemed like a bit of a mad one to go for him at $3 million. To go for him at an average of four seemed madder still and yet we're saving money is it is it so weird that we've brought him back at this price do you think i should have directed that at someone but never mind sorry ash i'll i'll take it as the guy who obviously is that was the figurehead for the what the hell what we're doing putting the tender on him camp i'm happy as you said reduce the cap it it's less than that sort of two million dollar figure i had in my head that i was obviously whinging about when we put the free nearly $3 million tender on. And yeah, like when he got first report three years, 12 million, I was a bit like, we're going to do this. It's going to be 4 million. It's double what I wanted to pay him. But I can see why, because as much as I love James Mitchell, showing it in the passing game that first year, the blocking still needs to come up to maybe get to where Brock Wright is. And with the ACL injury, he doesn't have some of the lateral mobility that Brock does. So yeah, I'm happy. We've matched the offer. Looking at the cap hits, I'm pretty happy with it. So, if we cut, we cut, it's basically a two year deal in my mind. We probably are going to cut him after that third year because probably by then we'll have the next guy up. That's what we're kind of going to be doing now, hopefully, is sort of having that conveyor belt. So, we have Brock for two years. And then if he plays well, we want to keep him around. That's fair. But if not, we'll hopefully have that next guy up. Keep going, keep going, because that's how good teams work. Look at the Ravens, for example. Uh, I was non committal. Uh... It was a case of you bring him back and you draft a guy or you don't bring him back and you definitely draft a guy. Because for me, like I say, James Mitchell, I like him, but he ain't tight into him. Yeah, I just don't think it, it, that is him. I still think we can upgrade him in the draft. I'm still bringing it. I, well, I still think the Lions bring a tight end. Like I say, after two years, we can get rid of him fairly cheaply if we have upgraded by then. So, yeah. It's not that much worse than the tender itself. I was surprised when we tendered him in the first place. I thought it wouldn't even have come to that stage. Like, were they that worried about losing him without getting compensation? I thought, but yeah, like I say, 49ers, no, no harm, no foul. Like you say, we keep him on roughly what they tried to send him off. So I'm happy. Like you say, it's a, it's a, it's a big year for him. I think, like I said, this feels like a prove it year. We've got, they've got to match the offer. They've shown a lot of commitment to him in that sense. So, yeah, I, I think he'll deliver. And if not, then, yeah, I expect them to bring another tight end in as a rookie deal this year. Someone's competition for him, which should be good for him. So, yeah, the room is as was. It's one of those where if, if the Panthers had made the offer, and we matched it. You'd be a bit like, did we need to do that? They're kind of just throwing money at someone. It shouldn't matter. 
But the fact it was the Niners, I think, does make a difference in terms of, I mean, what do we know about his actual value around the league, right? If the Niners are willing to pay him, suggest that there's probably more interest in what he can do on the field than maybe us as fans give him credit for. So, yeah, I mean, I think in the end, when the contract details came out as a relatively kind of easy decision, I wouldn't have been devastated had he left. But, but yeah, it, it's not like we're, we're matching an offer from some team who's just trying to throw the bank because they can spend it. Uh, no, I don't really have a. It's tight end two. I'm not really that fussed to be fair. <laughs> I imagine there's some. 49ers. He wants to get to pick two four nine. That's what matters. I imagine there's some forty nine fans that are relieved that probably saw the contract and probably thought, "I don't want him at that. I hope the Lions keep him." If I was a forty nine fan, I'd probably be like, "I'm kind of glad they've done that." What about you, Chris? Um. I think that the team knows who they know at this point. You always take a risk bringing someone else in. Brock Wright is fine. Like, I'm not going to lose sleep on money that isn't mine in April over this. I don't think the money hurts anyone. And again, this is not something that really drives a lot of my attention uh, for for the team just because it is it's it like if we're going to make a quibble over $12 million, I think that's too much penny pinching. We're, we're not, we're not a penny pinching team. It doesn't need to be like they, they're, 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 they're a competent team on this. The other thing that we've done this week is that the, the man himself has returned the, the man with the strongest helmet in football. Uh, Kindle Vildor is back on a $1.15 million deal with 167 grand guaranteed. Um, I mean, he's cornerback four at best, but he came in and outplayed Cameron Sutton last year. I mean, for me, win as a depth piece, considering you can cut him very easily if you don't want him here come training camp. Like, I, I, I love people talking about DPJ in the same vein as this. It's like, hang on a minute, with the amount you're paying these guys, they're, they're bubble guys at best. DPJ is a bubble guy. Not even, like, near the starting blocks. But what do you guys make of Kindle coming back? Because in a poor cornerback room last year, he was better than some guys. I was amazed at some of the pushback from fans. Because, I mean, going back to Chris's point around penny pinching, the vet men's, like, 900k. We're paying him 1.1k. So, like, by definition, for someone else to fill that role, we've got to pay them 900k. I, I, if we get someone better... Excellent. I thought he was kind of better than expected when he came in. And everyone's treating it like we're just penciling him to start at CB2 on opening day of the season. I I, I think it's been completely missed. I, I like the fact he's back, to be perfectly honest. He's going to be... He's currently CB4. You'd hope he's more CB5, CB6. Fine, go for it. Oh my God. I think Ideal that... Ideal world, he never sees the field and I don't lose sleep over the money he's spent. He's going to do well to win people over after the, well, the helmet. We all know, like you say, when he, if he does see the field, he's got to win people over. But yeah, I don't care about the contract and I don't care if he plays. But if it has to be called upon, like, so be it is what it is, isn't it? Like you say. Last year, the stank. He stank a little less. And that that is a measuring stick that we're measuring against. And that's not his fault. That's everyone else about him. To be fair, so I can't, I can't knock that against him. That people he beat out were worse. So yeah, but he could surprise us. Has a good year, gets a deal worth three, four million deal, million a year in twenty twenty five onwards. So it, it's the balls in his car, really. I mean, I think that like the dude walked in off the street and was one of the best DBs on our team. Imagine what he's going to do with a full off season to really integrate into the system, and he's he's going to be called about four. Or five or whatever. You're not going to need him to play starter reps all the time. And and if someone does go down, I actually feel quite comfy about having him in there. Like the worst thing he did last year was a helmet doink. Like it wasn't like something stupid like Will Harris does on a weekly basis or something like that. It was a, just a genuine accident. So I'm getting one more shot in before he's gone, guys, properly. So that that would be my last ever Will Harris jibe because he won't be here no more for me to jibe at. I really want but, us to re-sign him just to see your face. I was about to say, yeah. <laughs> if if you do, you will see a gro- you will see like... you will see a grown man have a hissy fit live, and I will not be on my own. You will see 
99% of Detroit have a hissy fit about him, rightfully so. But anywho, back to point. The worst thing he's done was a helmet doink. And like he's walked in off the street and been really good. So I do not mind at all. I think that's a terrific signing for depth for our room. I really do. So I'm all behind it. I do think that um, when you are someone like Kendall Vildor, you exceed certain expectations and expectations for him, meaning being a practice squad player. You, Lions have been in the business of showing that you get rewarded for that. Um, that's part of that dreaded culture word. That's part of, I think, how they want to run business. And to be honest, it makes all the sense of the world to me. So, yeah. Yeah, like... We obviously mentioned helmet catch, not to track on the guy, but yeah, he was also the guy infamously that gave up the big CD lamb touchdown, though we all agree there was missed holding on that. It shouldn't have counted. But yeah, Phil, I, I really like thinking back Phil Dorr. Like I know obviously Ant was infamously the leader of his fan club during late in the season, but he's a good scheme fit here. He's a good culture fit. And honestly, he came from, he's worse than coming off the streets. He came from the Chicago Bears practice squad. Like, there's nothing much worse than being a Bears practice squad. Like, they're that bad, but he was on their practice squad. They couldn't spot the talent. He comes here and actually does something. So not only does it kind of show he's a good guy, it kind of gave him his growth over that bit of the season where he had to start. Actually gave me a bit more faith in Aaron Glenn, weirdly, because there's a guy that the worst team in the league didn't even think was good enough to be on their roster. And he made a kind of viable starting corner at him, kind of like couple of years back with Jerry where he was a UDFA had all the tools, just needed to put it together obviously had his flaws as we all remember in that week two game against the Seahawks where his inability to turn his hips on coverage kind of came true but he's a good depth piece yeah hopefully we've got um, Carlton Davis and Amik Robinson to start on the outside he's currently slightly against probably CB3 but yeah as I'm probably going to guess with a load of our mock drafts if they come true He's going to slide down that depth chart and he'll be a good backup guy for if we need someone on the outside in those first couple of weeks. Plus special teams. Like, we all know I'm the big special teams guy here. I think Vildor does quite well on special teams. I know he didn't do as many reps towards the end of the season when we had to start him on defence. But even for that, with these new rules, could he play a role a lot on these coverage units and be a special teams ace? We can only wait and see. I wasn't going to shout this out, but I will do. We're not going to go down the rabbit hole of this, but uh, our own Stephen Collins is in the chat saying, I'd rather have snacks back than Will Harris, which... Anyway, we'll move on from my comment. (laughs) Or snacks. Oh, man. Right, we are going to get into our mock drafts, which requires me to move the video over a bit because, you know, it is what it is. You have to display stuff. You have to give the piggies what they want. That's not the way I wanted to do that. All right. Please go long ways here. There we go. All right. Here you go. That looks like that could work. Cool. Mm. Okay. So everyone can see the bloody first pick there, though, which is unfortunate. Move that there. All right. I think we are ready to rock. So I can only see five people, though, which is unfortunate. Hang on. Mm. Might be able to hit. There's got to be a zoom out function on that thing, I would imagine. Maybe. Oh, that the reason I can see five people is only five people were visible. Okay, enough oh. screwing around. This is going to work somewhat. Okay, we're going to go in snake format. We're going to reveal pick by pick with a justification and then scrutinization from the rest of the panel. So we're going to start with Anthony Fitzpatrick, the man who knows what 249 is going to be. But first, we're going to go with your pick at. 29 and don't who do is because you're just driving the expectation up and i'm not gonna be able to <laughs> fill it here so all right pick a 29 and um okay so maybe not the one people are expecting uh so my draft by the way i've labeled it the dmv draft this is the department of major violence as i call it because a lot of these guys be described as violent players um but i just want a team of ass kickers next year but at 29 Mishot people, I'm going to go cornerback. And first up, we're going to go with uh, Jaquincy McKinstry, also known as Kool-Aid, from Alabama. 5'11", 199 pounds. Now, for me, because 
I had four separate mocks for today, and I was trying to figure out which one would do us best. It took forever. I only decided on it about an hour ago, but the one thing that's really pissed me off over the years about Lions Corners is they've been dominated at the line of scrimmage and cooked on a barbecue afterwards. I just kind of hate how easy they get beaten. That needs to stop now. We need to start getting guys who are more physical at the line of scrimmage, who can play press better, but they can play both phases of the game. And for me, Kool-Aid is one of the top guys coming into this draft. He's a perfect balance of physicality and high athleticism as well. Um, Really quick feet on the line of scrimmage. No nonsense, like I say, whether it's a small or a speedy receiver, he's got the feet the change of direction pace to deal with them. If they're a bit stronger, he will get handsy with them. He will, you know, stay step for step. He's got the long speed down the field. I really like it. He's so smooth in transition. His technique in coverage is really good. He's a very solid tackler. You see very few examples of him balls in that up. So against the run game, he's very good. And I also think he's underappreciated as a blitzer as well. Bama don't really blitz these guys. Like, same with Branch, really, but... On occasion, they do, and you can see he's certainly got upside to do that. And as well, he's been a high-level returner in college, so you can also use him as a return guy. You can use him on the outside. But for me, yeah, it, it, it's just the fact that he's going to come up, he's going to play well in press, he's going to start kicking receivers. That's because receivers have too easy a time against this team. We need to change that mentality. And, of course, we need to get younger at corner as well because we bought a load of guys in, but we need to reset with the rookies. I'm going to spend a high pick on one. And for me, Kool-Aid will be the guy I would sit with most. And I reckon you can get him at 29. I don't have to sacrifice any picks to go up. And it fits in with my draft later. So, yeah. McKinstry's my guy at 29. Thoughts on Kool-Aid, boys? I love him. I want him. I just don't think he'll be there. I think he'll go too early. But, yeah, he. if I could have a guy fall to 29, I think I'd be wanting to him. He's just got a bit of a cocky, a bit of a swagger, a bit of an arrogance to him. I like that. He's brash. He does make mistakes, like you say, but he makes big plays. And we lack those. And yet, we can't jam guys at line of scrimmage because we're too busy giving signs seven to nine yard cushions. Like, that's got to go and this guy can stop that. He's going to get in your face. The era of CBs has been so fascinating. I'm... I'm not sure about where he will go in this draft just because I know, like, especially today, I know Cooper Jean just really you want to talk about improving your draft stock. Um, the draft stock of the position of CB seems to be constantly in flux. It feels like we've got more interesting guys, but no one who really stands out like a Sauce Gardner or a Devin Witherspoon of last year. I don't know. It's it's definitely, I don't think that's McKinstry. I don't even know if it's Quinion Mitchell, just given what Cooper DeJean is doing. And I'm not sure where that second level tends to fall. Um, so I'm not ruling it out entirely, but yeah, I do. I, I would be curious. I'd be fascinated if he's there at 29. I mean, I absolutely love him. It feels like his stock had been falling and falling and falling though. But this, this time, 12 months ago, he was like surefire first round pick could be a top 10 guy falling, falling, falling. Now I think the majority of mocks him out, out outside the first round, and I just think the media have kind of fallen too far on him because he's just super solid. I think he's probably one of the higher floor CBs in this draft. I mean, you guys know that I was calling Quinion Mitchell as a top 10 pick three months ago, four months ago, when he was still like an outside of the first guy. And yet, I think he's a boom or blast prospect. I can see Quinion getting found out at the next level. Equally, he could be the best cornerback in the league. Whereas he's not even in my top three corners in this draft. There we go. But for McKinstry, I just think his floor is so high that, you know, maybe he's not got the highest ceiling, but he's just going to go out there and do a really good job. I think at least he's going to be a high end cornerback too in this league because he's got the physicality, he's got adequate speed, got the measurables you want in terms of height, weight, whatever. So love him. Love him. It doesn't come with all the baggage that someone like a Nate Wiggins is going to because he could just fail physically. The Tom. cornerback group's interesting, right? Because everyone who can spell the Lions knows that the Lions kind of want cornerback help, at least the fancy. And so everyone's just penciling in all kinds of corners to the Lions, especially at 29. I like Kool-Aid. I think Kool-Aid is probably the best fit outside of um, Mitchell and, and Arnold, which both probably got in the top 15, right? Cooper Dijon's interesting. I, I could see the Lions loving him as a player, and obviously the workout today helps as well because he's he's all football. But at the same time, 
does he match what they want to do now? They want to move to more of a man scheme and he's probably a guy you want in more zone and playing off. You look at you look at Rakestraw, who's kind of almost like like Devon Witherspoon from um, last year, right? Again, a guy I think is better in in off. TJ Tampa. I actually really like TJ Tampa. It reminds me a bit of Carlton Davis, but the version of Carlton Davis the Bucks wanted to play off. And I'm like, a lot of these guys are just being penciled in. And I'm not sure they really match. I was tempted. I haven't done it. I was tempted to actually put Wiggins at 29. Wiggins is probably the best man man cover guy in the draft. Whether he holds up physically and as discussed, I think everyone's kind of just saying no chance he goes to the Lions. I probably agree with that. But if you want a pure man cover guy, Wiggins could be the best guy. So I'm fascinated to see what the Lions do at corner. I, I don't think they will go early because I think they probably only have one or two that they really like. And the chance of that person being there is obviously slim. Um, so yeah, I think there's going to be some some disappointed fans. I like Kool Aid as well. Like, and admittedly, I'm stealing this kind of, but well, borrowing it. The comparison from some videos I watched just to get the low down the cornerback class. But then I went right back to the tape and I kind of saw it. Kool Aid reminds me a lot of Jalen Johnson, who obviously we know quite well facing him twice a year. But there's some stuff there that's on tape. So one thing I know. And kind of refer to it with the coverage, for example. Kool Aid has does this whole thing, does this thing where yeah, he's late unlocks them, but he has the hand on the hip of the receiver. So you can just sign to tell where the cut's going without actually looking. So you can kind of keep his eyes on the QB if he needs to. Just little tiny things that he just gets taught at Bama are just so good. And yeah, I know his uh, partner Terry Arnold got all the buzz now because of what's happened this year of him getting the stats, but yeah, Kool Aid. I, I like him. Like, will he be there? It really depends because I know some teams might be a bit turned off by the whole Jones injury. Him putting off the surgery till like now, it might push him back in terms of being ready for training camp. And some teams might not want to take that risk. But for us, who he can kind of sit for a bit, learn. We won't have that baptism of fire that we had to have with Akuda, for instance, that kind of burnt Akuda out. He's kind of having to bounce back now with the Texans. Kool-Aid can sit there, get that foot right, get everything ready, and then if and when we need him, he should then be ready to slot in and be a yeah, damn good cornerback too, at the worst. At best, he could be a really good cornerback when we don't have shutdown corners anymore, like no source Garner exists in that, but if he can hold it with DK Metcalf, AJ Brown and that for however long he's in the league, and then whoever comes through, I'm going to be happy with him. All right, we're going to move on, and Ryan has traded down. So, Ryan, I'm going to come back to you after all the first round picks are done, and we're going to come straight back to you to start off the next round because of your trade down. Ash, you're in the same boat, so we're going to miss you out as well. You've traded down too. I'm next up, and I know that this pick is going to be derided by some people as unrealistic. Some too high and some too low which makes this the perfect Goldilocks pick, hmm. which is the man now known as his Johnny. It's Jazan Newton, the defensive tackle. Uh, myself, along with Ant, Ant, we profiled, um, I can't remember who it was, two years ago? Was it? Or was it last we pro- no, we profiled Laporta last year. We profiled Laporta. was playing against them. There we go, because he caught your eye, and so it was a kind of extra little bit in there on the Laporta show. And it was clear then that this guy was absolutely exceptional 12 months ago. And he just hasn't slowed down. He's a a great disruptor, potentially DT1 in this class. I know that people think the debate is over in this with with him being DT2, but I don't necessarily agree. Good two-gapper and one-gapper, but he's a disruptor. He gets upfield. He's got violent mentality, stunts really well, great explosion out of his stance. He... Puts bad plays behind him. I know that's maybe not the best trait that you want to see because it means he has bad plays. But the thing is, you have to just forget about it and get on with it. And the ability to do that is a really good Lions trait. Good tackling technique. He gets his arms up in the blocking lanes when he isn't able to penetrate up fields. He's got good pass rush technique. He can bull rush, bull rush but he's got a swim move. He's got a rip move. He's a very polished prospect. And maybe the most underrated thing about all of this, because I keep talking about this and people are batting away this thought process, but 
In the next 12 months, we need to pay, potentially, Jared Goff, Penn Azul, Taylor Decker, and Aleem McNeil. That's going to be hard. At least, if we all resign them in one off-season, that year's going to be fine. And then year two's going to suck for all of those deals. And the answer might be, one of them walks. Well, let's get insurance up to all of those positions then. We already do it course back, but we don't at Penetrating 3 Tech. Johnny Newton provides insurance in the case that we can't agree to a long-term deal with Aline McNeil, and it means we can rotate them without losing anything. So this is an easy pick for me when he was available on the board at this spot. His draft position seems to vary between maybe as high as 10th and as low as like 45th. I've never seen at this stage of the cycle a person in the media have such a wide range at the top of the draft. And so I think it's... I would be surprised if he's available here because he's that good to me. But it's happening so often that he's fallen to that position in mock drafts I can't just keep ignoring him because it's unrealistic. Because eventually he kind of speaks into reality. And we talked about him before, I'd reference that you're the leader of the fan club of his. Talk to, <laughs> talk to us about, about Jazan. He was defensive tackle one 12 months ago. And it's not... like I don't even know why there's a discussion over this. And if he falls to 29... That's the only reason I've not really taken him, because he, sh he shouldn't be there. If he falls to the Lions, then Le I've said someone should be jailed for gross negligence if you let him come here. Um, he's fantastic. Like he's one of the most disruptive, explosive defensive tackles that the draft has seen in some time. Like I think he'd have been challenging for DT one last year. So like he's he's absolutely amazing. He absolutely wrecked Iowa in that line last year. Like two, three guys on his own, triple teams, double teams, doesn't matter. He found a way through. This year he's been just as good. Um it, it's it shouldn't even be a point of discussion that he's a round one pick and that he's DT1. The only reason I can think he's not is because people are just trying to create narratives and, you know, it's draft time. Let's create something to talk about, but he should be there. He should be gone by 15 or 20. He's amazing. He comes here, I would... Oh, you would you would see me excited, like a kid on Christmas morning. Like him, <laughs> Rita, and Ellie, like, good luck running on that. Like, just, you know... Send the best of what you got. We'll take it down. What a goal line set that would be if you had the three of them in the middle. Um, Chris, have you seen much of, of Johnny? Uh, I have not. It's, it's something. It's a name that I'm still kind of uh, getting used to. I love the name Jerzan. I, funny enough, um, I play a lot of Dungeons and & Dragons, and I'm pretty sure I wrote da down a name like Jerzan for an NPC. Um, so, uh, look... I, I think any investment in the trenches fits the Detroit Lions, no matter what you are. Like, that's the identity of the team. That's what you uh, base yourself upon. Um, you're going to, I, but I, I'll i be honest, I think the only Illinois game I watched this year was um, uh, the Toledo game. That was this year, right? I'm genuinely losing my mind. Ooh. I. I actually don't know but uh, i mean i mean i mean just just thinking about it though off top of the head you, you've got mcneil you definitely want someone to pair up with him i know you signed dj reader uh there's there's plenty of room though to always yeah. have more there's yeah. there's always room for depth it was illinois toledo in september yeah that just sucked gone. that yeah. sucked toledo could have really won that game opening up to the floor jazan newton he's great and like you say, yeah, he fits what the lines like, stack both sides of the ball. And in, like you said, the next year to 18 months, I fully expect Liam McNeil to test free agency because I think he'll want more. Like I say, he might want the bag. Like I say, unfortunately, we're going to be offering a lot of guys the bag. But it would be nice to have a natural replacement if he goes out there and gets paid like a star, which I think he could do. So that would just solve the problem straight away. Well, I mean, we love serious point. With all the DT contracts coming up right now and how much he flew up the PFF boards, if he has another year like that, is anyone going to be surprised if he says, I want four years, 100 mil? Is anyone genuinely going to be surprised? Because the market's exploded. Are we really going to pay that? I, I'd love a lean, but... 
I think you'd have to tag him, but I don't want to do that. Like you say, that that's the world where you, yeah, he just becomes a, a tag candidate then, don't they? But yeah, like I said, yeah, it'd be a great front, like I said, Newton. I think he's very realistic for what the Lions like and what they like, the body type as well. He's got the builds, the Lions like, is it? He's a big, sturdy boy, like I said, but can also then get after it when needs be. So yeah, he'd be a fun addition to defensive line. It would be a big investment to Aaron Glenn. And it would be like, it's do or die, Glenn. If we give you Jazar Newton and you're sucking after 10 games, you're packing your bags because we've invested very heavily in your defensive line. So it, it's going to be a big testament to him. But yeah, I would like that pick. And I also think he'll be in that kind of area. I wouldn't even mind going, what, two, three spots up for him for minimal capital. Tom Ash, any thoughts? Always a fan of investing. I don't think you can ever have <laughs> enough people on defensive line. If you look at the Eagles, look at the Niners. Do the Niners really need Chase Young? Can't believe the Eagles are taking Jalen Carter. These good teams with good defensive lines just keep restocking talent. So if someone goes out the door, they've got someone ready to replace them. And it means you don't have to rely on Ali McNeil to stay healthy for 17 games and to play 80% of snaps. So that's not realistic for these guys, right? So... Yeah, I mean, if, if he's there, I'd, I'd absolutely love it. Again, similar, I'd be surprised if he was, but, I mean, what do I know? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, like, I am just dread if we do take him, Matt's poor ears whenever we get to a, 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 a third and goal situation. Because not only will I be calling for a Liam McNeil fullback dive, now I can also have the his Johnny play with him, with Johnny Newton running the ball. And, like, Matt is going to hate me. Also, I love the fact that Matt gave us a little insider scoop there that he believes that Amon Ra is going to be signed this offseason because he didn't mention him. So either we sign him this offseason or Matt's letting Amon Ra set Brown walk. So which that's going to be fun to discuss in a few weeks. But yeah, I'd, I'd love the pick as well. Like I like the um, Byron Murphy as well. He's But he is clearly DT too. Johnny Newton's done it over a couple of years. I like those kind of proven production guys rather than the one season wonders, as we'll come on to in a bit. Right, Tom, you're up with your first pick and you are going in a different direction. Yeah, so I guess housekeeping up front. What's one thing we know about Brad Holmes having had him for the last few years? He doesn't give a hoot above your bit about your big board. He doesn't care about it. He's not looking about the guys you think you can trade down and get value from. He doesn't care about the guys that we see the same names again and again. So I guess for the top three picks here, I've tried to go away from some of the more popular names we've seen. Probably less so with this first one, but definitely with the two following. Um, prior warning, people who see this mock without the context, they're probably going to hate it. Probably going to lose their minds. I'm okay with it. We're good. We're good. So I mentioned about the cornerback group earlier when we were talking. Um, I guess if we think about some of the other positions, I think wide receivers similar. If you think about A.D. Mitchell, you think about Brian Thomas, the Lions probably only like maybe one of those guys. So the chance of them being there, I don't think is necessarily realistic. Or it is realistic, but I don't think it's what will play out. Um, so for me, when it came down to it, I was looking offensive line. That's where I think there's lots of depth at this point in the draft. Um, and it came down to I actually, I will be most tempted out sale but Tom, obvious Tom hang on didn't get that you, <laughs> you went a bit janky then and you still are I think by the video just say hello can you hear me now yeah that's better okay start from that little bit again okay I'm going to ignore the person I didn't go for I'm going for Kingsley Super Martin. Oh, we've gone again. And the reason being... There we go. There we go. We're back. Sorry. Kingsley. Oh, no. Kingsley Super no, Martin. I <laughs> Apologies, everyone. Do you want to move on for now? Yeah, okay. We'll circle back to you. I've revealed the pick on the thing, but we'll we'll circle back. Right. Steve is here with us uh, in the live chat, but not on the show. Uh, we've discussed why already, but he is angering the entire show, maybe the entire show, by picking defensive end from Penn State, 
Chop Robinson. Doesn't anger me. Chop's a dog. Let's talk about that then, Chris. Chop, what do you think? He's fascinating. I remember when we did our combine preview and it was a lot of this is a very split group of people out there who talk about Chop Robinson. Some who talk about him being an athletic freak like Dane Brugler does and other guys who won't even put them in the top 100. Um, he's fascinating. I, I I really off the top of my head without even doing without doing a ton of prep preparing because I didn't have Chop for myself like, you know. I mean, where, where am I going to go? 9.7 Raz uh, from our friend Kent Lee Platty. Um, just an explosive guy, just tough, competitive, um, very versatile on the edge. I uh, probably could kick him inside if you absolutely need to. Uh, I think, what was it? Uh, just he's, he's, he's not, he's one that I still believe is a day one pick. Um, even though it borders on the fringe, I think that his play at Penn State kind of speaks for itself sometimes. And um, he's got everything you really want on a guy. You, you want to put someone opposite of Aiden Hutchinson. I don't like him very much, only because for me, he's the, the epitome of all the gear and no idea. Um in the same way that uh, Lucas Van Ness is to me, and uh, Adatomiwa, Adabare, and kind of all of these guys who, if they are coached well over a period of time, could, their ceiling is ridiculously high because their athletic profile says it is. But when you come into the... When you can't dominate college football by getting sacks, I question you because the competition we're going up against is just so much worse, even in the Big Ten, than it will be in the pros. So, for me, Chop's a project, and that's fine. Projects at edge get taken late in the first round, so this is about the right sort of range. If we're doing predict, it, it depends how you're doing the mock. If you're doing the mock for what I'd like, Chop's a fine pick, because that's you and your philosophy and whatever. But when I think about the Lions... They like proven guys in their first round pick. The guys who have actually done good things at college. So, Jameer Gibbs. Jack Campbell was very accomplished in college, even though that actually hasn't translated to the pros as well as it could have done. Then you have people like Penny Sewell, Aiden Hutchinson. All of these guys were fantastic in college. And while Chop was very disruptive, he didn't get to the course back very much. So... I just don't it's, see them. But going it's for it's. Him. I mean, it's Penn State. What do we want to do? Are we going to keep continuing like acting like James Franklin knows what the, what he's doing over well, there at College does, Station? So. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Great. No, he doesn't. No, okay, fine, whatever. But it's a defense in the Big Ten. Like, I, I, I want talent. I want talent. You can coach the rest of it. Like, I'm, and and we should trust who the Lions have had and what they have done with their defensive line to say you can look at something like Chop Robinson and and just get that going and juicing. This has not been a place the Lions have been. You can get guys who have had that production in college and are ready to go in the NFL. When you're picking in the top of the draft, this is what it looks like when you're picking down later. Like it is, you're going to have to, you're going to have to take some sacrifices and I'd rather take the sacrifice on the side of talent versus how it went the other way for a long time in Detroit, where you take guys who fit what you want to do, who proven what you did in college, but they just don't have, they don't have the competitive fire in them, or they just don't have the measurables that allows them to dominate at that level. Once they are coached up. Any other thoughts on chop boys? Be an ironic pick since we just fired and hired and fired his old D line coach. <laughs> we literally just had the guy that coached him in college. So I said, Penn State. Coach. I like Chop. For me, 29, no, because the issue for me is I'm not sure about the run support. I don't, I, I think kicking him inside will be an issue. Frankly, I don't think he'll want to do that. I feel like he is going to be the, I want to be the Y9. I want to just be like all pass rush. And we, we can't have that. You've kind of got to have the balance that I think he lacks. But yeah. yeah, I can see them taking him. And I feel like, yeah, growing pains, you will get them probably probably in the wrong game. But you never know. Could, could bloom, like I say. He's got the intangibles. He's the athletic freak. But for what you want from him, there are options later. 
that's all I'll say. No other thoughts? No? Stop on, baiting me into talking about Ras Ash. Stop it. <laughs> First of all, his name's Damien. I don't know why. Like, half the draft picks this year have weirded names because no one wants to speak them. But... Because it's cool. But no, because it's cool. It's cool. Right. Let me tell so, you, one of the I'm most... In... So, uh, right, so one I'm of the... Gonna... Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I, I, I just want to add very quickly. I just, I want you to understand that in the lore of American football, one of the most famous players in the history of the game from the original XFL was a man who just had on the back of his jersey, "He hate me." Like he hate me. I don't know his real name. I never will. But he's a legend. All right, he's a legend. Don't all these it, kids Ash. want to come out and don't do all it. All these kids want to come out and call themselves something like Chop Kool Aid. That's cool. Like I saw a pro, I saw a project a while back, uh, coming out of high school who got drafted. I don't even know where he got where he went to uh, college, but uh, Kobe Buffalo meat. <laughs> like you, you, like man. Like, let me let me tell you. Like you, we're talking. You're talking about America. You're talking about a country of far of of farmers, ranchers, and ranchers and hustlers. Like you're gonna have some weirdness. That NIL money, man, he, he'll be rolling in that dollar. <laughs> <laughs> and State takes care of its own. Oh, dear. All right. Okay, fine. I'll be the one who says it. Chop is a slightly glorified version of what Adatom Yi, what Adabo Warrior was last year. He's a RAS warrior. He's an athletic warrior. He's not a football player. Like, you can have all that athletic ability and you can be great and that, but your college production is so low on a defensive line, when you are on a defensive line full of studs, you have been for your entire collegiate career, and you can't produce. And it was the same with Adebowale. He couldn't produce when he was in college. He went through the combine. He went through the pre-draft process. Everyone saw the flashy RAS numbers, the flashy athletic numbers. And what was he, the worst graded rookie in the entirety of college, in the entirety of the NFL last year? Because it doesn't translate. Because he doesn't have the skill to go with it, like. I know that Penn State defense very well. There are a lot of good players that come from there, but the thing they have, they have technique as well as the production and everything to go with it. He doesn't. Like, I screamed this blue moon about Adabo Warrior when everyone was doing it last year. I will say the same with Chop. It would be a massive mistake at that point. And, you know, I'm all about this. It's technique over athleticism when it comes to this and my draft is mocked on this and I will fight this corner and I know no one else does, but it would be a massive mistake for us. To, it's like with Legetta. That would be a massive mistake at 29. Everyone's just, oh, he's athletic. He's really good. Yeah. Took him five years to get in his college football team. And he beat up on a load of poor teams this year. Every time he played a half decent opponent, he couldn't do anything. It's the same. You don't pick these guys in the first round. You pick guys who show they can do it. Our team, our general manager picks guys who've been there and done it. He hasn't. I'll just be honest about it. That's how I feel. Tom, have we got you back? You tell me. Sounds good I to think, me. I think it works. It's the downside of moving into a new house today and therefore going from one gigabyte fiber to low internet. Mm. Um, just on the chop point, I mean, a lot of the Penn State... Um, players have come out as freak athletes and they've all done various things so i don't think him being a great athlete and not producing necessarily means one or the other right i mean when adafe owe came out he was i think tested as a better athlete than chop didn't have loads of production went at the end of the first round has turned into a pretty nice player he i wouldn't say he's turned into a superstar i wouldn't say he's turned into a disaster but i if mean I he was doing things last year if I remember rightly, Owe had even worse production because I think he had half a sack in his final year of college. It was something like hilarious. Yeah. yeah. And um, it, it was a really similar conversation, right? And it begs the question, what on earth are the Penn State coaching staff doing to these guys who are such good athletes and not producing? And yet you've still got a defense that works. It's it's odd. Anyway, um, do you want me to, to loop back? Yeah, let's loop back. We've talked about Chop for a little bit. So Kingsley Suamata Ear. Yeah, very quickly. So um, 6'5", 3'26", uh, Raz of 9.38. I mean, most people already know the story. He's Penesel's cousin. 
This is someone who the Lions met with the combine. For me, I think he's a perfect fit in what the Lions want to do. I think as a player, he's got a load of upside. He is raw. He's athletically gifted, but he is kind of lacking technical discipline. A perfect example of a guy who you can afford to redshirt. What we've seen with our offensive line the last however many years is it's rare you get the first five up, but as best we can, we can keep him off the field short term. We can coach him up. We can cross-train him at guard and tackle, and depth at both positions is an issue. So, And then long-term, he can slot in at right guard next to Penae Sewell. If Taylor Decker walks, if Taylor Decker retires and Penae moves over, you've got a guy who can potentially play right tackle as well. So for me, it's a little high for him, but I'm trying to think and and go with what I think Brad is going to do and potentially take guys who he likes because he knows he won't they won't be there at the next pick he has, which seems to be a trend of his. So... Yeah, I think he's a, he's an interesting player. Definitely boom or bust. Could be quite a cool story. Ash, what do you think about Kingsley? So uh, I also kind of like him, but not in the first because number one, number one, I just have players high ranked him, but also as people probably pop up with in a second because I've mentioned him before as like a second. He as well. He there is a few more issues. So for me, yeah, with red shirt in him, I don't think he's going to see the see the field much, even as a swing tackle role in year one, just because he does have those technique issues. I think one of the things that, and I credit, I think it's Bish and Brown on the Detroit Lions podcast for this. He doesn't. He sort of leans forward on his sets quite a bit, so he can just sort of he can overpower guys, but if they sort of get the power on him, he's just flat on his back. Like there is just some technique issues that do need to be worked. He's got athleticism. He could for uh if he gets the right O line coach, which to be fair, coming here would probably be the best situation for him with that because we have the best O line coach in the league. He could really turn out to be like a sort of penne light soul, uh penne penne light soul, penne soul light in that uh, all the athleticism in that like all the world, and he could get there and be like a really damn good tackle. But he also just has a very high bus range as well. Like it could all fall apart. Could be like a Mecky Beckton or that guy that the Titans drafted and then quit his career to be a rap star, release one song and ain't even tell that that. He just has such a wide range of outcomes that I'd prefer something that's a bit more solid for our first round pick. What about the rest of you guys? Any thoughts on Sue Matic here? Huge fan. Love him. It's 9.1. Oh, yeah. If we don't take him at 29, he won't be there next time we pick. And like I say, it's one of those where I'm along, I've got the same kind of thought frame, Tom. Like, I'm looking further into the future. Like you say, the, the precarious nature of our O line, it does worry me in the back of my mind how it's going to look in 12, 12 months right now. And yeah, very solid option. Like I say, could. Like I say, no pressure to start this year. And then next year, you're hoping you can plug in hits the ground running. So I, I completely understand, like you say, the methodology behind this pick. And he does, yeah, he's got that that kind of demeanour that I kind of think they do like and would look towards. So I, I honestly, I wouldn't hit it. It's a long-term player that could have real long-term benefits. Chris? Nope, I got nothing really to add here. All right. And I know that you're not the president of his fan club. You know, not really. Um, I did like him going into... I, I did like him because uh, I, I profiled him before the season. Um, but I remember specifically watching the game against Oregon and there's always a player that will stand out to me. There was a run play and he had two blocks to do. The first guy he just ran straight past and the second guy he swatted an arm out at and didn't even bother. I don't think he's anything like Penne. I think he's a lot more lazy. He is not anywhere near as committed as his cousin is. I just... Uh, there's too many plays where I'm like... Eh, there just ain't effort there, and I just don't buy it. And, you know, those Oregon edges are okay. They're not good, but they gave him a lot of issues. And again, when I say the run game, I just I don't see the effort required to succeed here. I'm with that. I th- I, I'm more he's going to bust category than he's going to do well. Um, but that's just what I've seen from watching, you know, me. I'm nobody to talk about this. I just watched eight bits. I just didn't see it. I don't get it. I think the nicest thing I can say about him is that I have him more highly ranked than Tyler Guyton, but that isn't a compliment. So, yeah, that, that's it. I can't. I don't have anything more to add. Um, and and I, I don't know if you got the first bit of my rant before. Obviously, broke up the uh, 
this isn't what I would do. This is what I'm trying to put myself in, in Brad's shoes here. Um, and I agree. I mean, l- looking at him and seeing how he moves, he should be a much better run blocker than he is. But there is something there. There's definitely something there. Right, Chris, you're last up uh, on round one picks, and you are going again in a different direction. Yeah, I'm kind of in love with this particular guard. Um, I've you, you're about to me- you're about to get a really big fan of this show, by the way. Yeah, I well, this is also again. Uh, I've from people I've talked to. You want to talk about athletic freaks, but you also want to talk about a guy who I play, who I always like to ter- term playing with uh, raw, unfiltered violence. Um, UConn's Christian Haynes, who I know oh, had quite a bit of a uh, <laughs> guard. Yeah, you're nice. probably the best. What? What I do? What I do? No, no, no. And looks at you and said, "But yeah, but he he's a big Haynes fan." Just shh. yes. Anyway. Okay, okay. <laughs> Haynes is in my mind the best pure guard in this draft. I know the Lions took Zeitler. They'll have him for one year. That's a perfect chance for someone like Haynes to really come in. But um, I want a guy who's going to be another anchor here in the pass game. Um, I'm not whatever the future might hold for the lions. Like they clearly want to be stout in pass protection. It's what makes them work. And Haynes does that. He does that extremely well. Um, He's, he's just, he's got enough power to be one of those anchors you really want in the inside. I think this is probably the perfect piece to say once again, that you are uh, reinvesting in your in your priorities in the offense line. It might be a bit of a reach at 29, but I think at that point, like a to, to go with Tom's philosophy here, we we've, we've seen that reach doesn't mean anything to Brad Holmes. Uh, if he likes a guy, he will go for a guy. This seems like a guy who has both the technique and, and the uh, athleticism and measurables on there. I think uh, by RAS, he was, I believe, uh, Frick, what was it? Nine point nine point ten. Um, he's also, I know from talking to Kent, one of his favorite guys in the draft right now. One of those things that, much like when we got when the Lions got Lee McNeil, we would both be running around nonstop with uh, like school children with heads cut off. Mixing metaphors. Uh, what else is there to really say about Haynes? I mean, back to back third team All American honors. Just a just a. Again, I like dogs. I like dogs. Showed up at the senior bowl. He's a dog. Let's just go straight to Ant just to hear it because you're... I didn't expect you to have an audible reaction to it, but you did. Um, you, See, are a big, you are a big fan. He's my favorite player in the draft, full stop. And he has been for the last year. Chris just simultaneously made me proud and ashamed because like he made me proud because he's like picked him but he made me ashamed because I've not picked him this high um oh god yeah, yeah. I, I know I know they're like here's the problem here's the problem too for the lions is like their position means you can't be yeah you, 61's too low 29 you're like oh that's too high I'd rather take high than him not being there at all. Like this is again this is the real problem this is more of a problem to me than 29 is that the next pick is 61 like there's yeah. a large dead spot in the top 50 the lions have to deal with so spoil it this is my you may as well put it up he's mine in my second round one he's he's been there forever and a day and and as chris says he is the most aggressive violent run blocker in this draft of, of any offensive lineman he's 6'2 313 pounds of man moving machinery that that is literally what he is got everything you want technique strength intelligence and tape. So for me, the technique's the great. He's one of the best technicians when it comes to offensive line in this draft. Why? The system they run at UConn. So Mora and Nick Charlton, who was his OC down there, they run the pro spread offense, kind of similar to what the Rams do in the NFL. It requires doesn't require them to be positionally versatile on the line. He's only ever played right guard, but it re- it's very skill intensive. It requires them to be highly skilled at what they do with their technique. And you see that with all the guys coming out there like you've seen what the Rams have just done they've paid Jonah Jackson very specifically a left guard who's played for the Freya for a long time they've paid the right guard a ton of money they've got Steve Avila in there highly talented interior offensive lineman to make that system work he will walk into any system in the NFL in terms of its run game and he will slot in day one as a guy and as a pass protector he's also really good he's got such a base and an anchor to him he, as soon as he gets set good luck trying to move him 
Like the dude just plays with violence. He finishes off, he pancakes. Like he will do that extra little bit on the end of the play just to make it hurt that little bit more. And the main thing is for me, people go, oh, it's UConn, but he's got tape against good teams. They've played against Clemson, NC State, Michigan is the one that people should watch because they got blown out like 60 to nothing. But if you highlight him in a bubble and how he plays in that game, like he's playing on a line that's got Marzi Smith on it, who was a day two pick. Chris Jenkins, who's going to be a day two pick. And, oh God, who's the other one? Mason Graham might be a day one pick next year. And he dominates a lot of them. Like, in a nutshell, he dominated everybody on that Michigan line. And that Michigan line's pretty damn good. So you've seen the tape, you've seen the technique. He's And I just like the player. Like, he's been loyal to UConn for five years. He could have left in the age of NIL, gone to a big flash deal. No, he stayed, took the hard route, the route of grit. Like, these are the players the Lions like, and he's just amazing. Like, like anyone else more than anybody, he ends up in Detroit. We've got ourselves a good one. And in our situation, Sightless a one-year guy. Like, you don't have to start him right away. You can phase him in this year, but by the end of the year, Zeitler's phased out, Haynes is in. you got your guy for the next five, four years, whatever, minimum. So he makes perfect sense for us. All right, I'm going to pick up the pace here. Does anyone have any thoughts briefly on Haynes? Love him. No, but I've just realised I forgot to add a pick to the sheet. I forgot we even had a 61. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put well, someone in. You got tra- No, you have a trade. You have another trade, according to the sheet. Anyway, hmm. you work that out. Any more thoughts on Haynes? Awesome. I love it. I, I genuinely love it. love it. All right. Ah. We'll move on to the guys who traded down. And first, Ryan McCluskey, your first pick was on a similar theme. Yeah, so... I don't think the Lions are committed to picking in the first round, even though the, the draft's in Detroit. And that might upset a lot of people. And if it does happen, it's going to upset a lot of people. For me, 29, it's no man's land. The guys I really want, I don't think will be there. And I just don't see the value of waiting. So I'm trying to be rational. So I'm trading down with the commanders. They're going to come up to 29 for Brian Thomas Jr. to pair with uh, Dean Daniels. Like I say, I'm sending 29... A 2025 4 from 201, a 36 40 and 78. But I have missed 61. I'm not part on the sheet. I thought okay. that was a fair trade. I'm taking now this guy I would take at 29. I'm taking Graham Barton, the offensive guard center out of Duke. Let's say six foot five, 310 pounds, two time all C all ACC. We could be replacing one or three of our interior line next year. As he does, it could be the best centre potentially, but right now he can fill in at guard. He offers proper competition to Zeitler, who's on a one year deal. Graham, let's say, is here a two year deal, but the interior does need an upgrade. He's he is great. He is all around tough. He is physical. He's got strong hands, a good base. He can keep guys up. He can keep them in front of them. Like I say, his hand movement and placement is really good, and he's not afraid to get out on screens funnels and to the next level and like see he's a bruiser he's a more like say he is pretty polished and pro ready like i said i would love him i see you can work him in now and if the lions are happens to frank this year for me our season will kind of be on life support like i said because you keep graham in and you're back with what coyote our seeker maybe a guard i don't like it and my future at center and or guard for me i'm going to address it now i say i think this guy is he feels like a Lions lineman. I said, our riches, the strong get stronger. I'm just going to keep investing in the O-line until it fails. Thoughts on Graham Barton? Love him. As an ACC guy, he, I, as an, well, as an FSU fan, I remember him being able to hold up against Verse and Patrick Payton. So I loved him then. Like, yeah, bad Duke team. Him kind of entering the starting lineup along with some of the other players like Ryan Leonard and that. You can see the turnaround. And for me, he was one of the reasons because he solidified that offensive line, was able to protect Riley Leonard, and they turned it around. It's going to be interesting to see how Duke move on with basically everyone going now. But if we can get Barton, I'm extremely happy because, yeah, he can play all three interior spots. And in my opinion, if we need him to at push, kind of like how we had to last year with Colby, I'd happily stick him at tackle. Like he can feasibly play all five spots for me 
and I wouldn't be too mad. Chris, have you seen Bowen at all? Ah. Uh... Not really. No. Again, uh, once we get out of this a little bit, I'm going to be out of my element and just kind of guys who I've looked at. And um, I, I, I'm going to object to this just because it's Duke. <laughs> just, that's 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 where I'm going to go. I I have no love for Duke. I will never love. It. I mean, this isn't even basketball for Duke, and I'm not. No. <laughs> Tom. Fuck Duke. <laughs> <laughs> that was not me. Just to be really clear. Yeah. Even though I was introduced before that statement, no. <laughs> I know if if Jackson Powers Johnson, if Graham Barton, both of them are there at twenty, or either of them are there at twenty nine, I think they are seriously in play. Let alone a couple of spots further down. Um, I'm not sure either of them will be, uh, but they both of them fit what the Lions do. Um, I'm sure we're, we're all going to talk about it at different points during this draft. I mean, the Lions' offensive line—if you take Penny Sewell out, there is no long term plan for any of the other four positions. And there's a realistic chance that any of those four guys aren't here in two years. Taylor Decker has been in the league a long time, right? There's a chance he's not coming back. There's a chance he could retire. Ragnar, we've talked about. The interior guys we've talked about. I mean, I just think you've got to you've got to kind of overload this and actually start investing again in the offensive line. And it might not be glamorous and you might have fans in week six saying, why do we spend picks on guys? They're not even seeing the field. Why didn't we go for X, Y, Z? I, mean, I just think you've got to you've got to load up. So yeah, I I I, I like the player. I, I I think I don't love the player. I don't hate the player. If that makes sense, because I just think he's really good. I don't think he's glamorous. It's almost a bit like when we took Frank Ragnow, and I was like, yeah, I think he's a good player. Turn into an absolute stud. But that's probably where I sit with Graham Barton. If he could just be, you know, Frank Ragnow, I'm I'm probably okay with it. And thoughts on Graham Barton? I like him. Solid. He could be good at the next level. Just it's a preference thing here. I just wonder what I think he's going to be a good player. Versus I keep him at tackle as well. Screw kicking him inside. I think he'll thrive as a left tackle in the NFL. You've stolen my point. Uh one of my favorite players in the entire draft. Uh I think in an ordinary draft cycle he could possibly be a top ten player, top twelve player. I think he's that good. The five position versatileness of him but I would also keep him at left tackle. Um, he is, he's is he got great anchor. He really drives his legs. Great run blocker. Can maybe overcommit sometimes on guys stunting outside then in. So maybe just got to work on that a little bit. He's got wrestler traits without ever having actually been a wrestler as far as I can tell. But you can see the way he sort of leverages his body that he's got that sort of mentality. It's a formal lacrosse player. So you can really see the power in those arms and shoulders. Um just very, very polished, and I, 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 I can't believe he lasts this long. I, I, I do not believe that he's not a first round pick. He's, he's got one of my true first round grades, if you put it that way. Which, after listening to the one of these years podcast about true first round grades, maybe I should stop using that term. But never mind. Um, yeah, love him. Uh, let's move on to Ash. Your first pick out of your trade. Yep. Yeah, so. I got to 29 and there were a couple of players on the board that I was happy with. And I had an offer from a certain Kansas City Chiefs team, I believe. So I traded down with them a couple of picks and with a late round pick swap, picked up some mid round picks and such, which we'll see later. Nothing in the future because I wanted to make sure it was all on this mock draft. And one of my players fell there and I'm just going to move slightly to the side. So you can see that little cut up thing there because if you've been watching this podcast this year, you've heard all about this receiver. What people think Xavier Leggett is, that is what Keon Coleman, the ex-receiver out of Florida State, actually is because he's done it over multiple years. Not this year, obviously, being of uh, wide receiver one for the Knowles, putting up numbers, even with a uh, Jordan Travis, who I loved a bit, but his deep accuracy fell off. So Coleman was having to do a lot of the contested catch stuff was getting used mostly on slants, screens, and deep uh, deep throws didn't really do much in terms of ins and outs because he just wasn't asked to do that. But he also did it last year on a, as much as I hate to say it, as a sort of closet MCU fan, go Spartans. Um, he was doing it with a bad team there, and he was still putting up numbers. This is a guy who's shown it in two systems with a bad QB and one of the best QBs in college last year, 
until that unfortunate hip drop tackle ended his season. I will hate that forever. Um, but contested catch guy, and yes, okay, people might be turned off by the 40 time, but the GPS speed, which is what this team values, showed it in the gauntlet, was one of the fastest, if not the fastest guy in that gauntlet drill. Yeah, route running might need a bit of work. Release package needs a bit of improvement, but who better than Randall L to teach him that, who at the league was, I think, remember rightly, was known for his releases in that. This is a guy who's your prototypical ex, only does the contested catch stuff, and can be taught to do everything else, and I think he would slot right in as our sort of wide receiver for an inverted commas, playing an X role, and he locks down that receiver position cheaply for the next couple of years. When we eventually pay Amon Ra, we can still uh, have that sort of cheap, good uh, starting receiver in the sort of in the team, playing a lot of snaps. Any thoughts on Keon Coleman, boys? Before today, I was totally like, no first round wide receivers, but Trading back a few spots, picking up an extra capital, that does sweeten the deal a little bit for me. Like I said, I can kind of get behind that. And yeah, I like him. I like Keon Coleman. I think he'd make a great addition to our corps. Like I said, I, it feels like a luxury bit. It feels like right now, I suppose if the window's open, you can make a luxury pick. Like I see you can add a dynamic weapon to your receiving core. Like I say, you're going to tie it down. You get the benefit of staying in the first round, so you get a fifth-year option, which is still important. So, like you say, it benefits straight away. So the pick I've made, you might not see Graham for the whole year. You see Keon Coleman week one. Like you say, he could be an in, he could be an offensive rookie of the year candidate, essentially, in this offense with how it works. Like I think it's that kind of potential stroke. So, yeah, I like the fact that you'd reap the benefits pretty quickly of this pick, which which would be good. Just quickly, I think uh, Coleman's getting overthought a little bit because of the 40 time. It reminds me a lot of Michael Thomas when he was another big 6'3", 210 kind of guy and he ran a 4'6", I think, or like a high 4'5", and he slipped to the start of the second round or kind of in somewhere in the top 40. He turned out to be a pretty good play, even if he was clinically insane. Um, I don't. I think uh, Keon Coleman's a bit stiffer than that, but, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It feels like he's getting push down because of a 40 time and people just need to get over it. So yeah, w- wouldn't, wouldn't hate it. All right. I'll move on to the next pick from Ryan, because it comes before all of the others. You picked up 40 overall as well, Ryan. Yeah. <clears throat> now this is one of my crushes. Like I said, he's already been mentioned by someone that may not fit what we're trying to do, but I've just found love him. I love TJ Tampa from Iowa State. 6'2", <laughs> He's physically empowering. Like I say, he's got ball skills. He's got fluid hips. Press man, I'm not sure. Like I say, that, that may be where we have to work, like I say, on that. Like I say, off coverage, he's got good instincts. He's quite young as well. He's been part of a good Cyclones defense the last couple of years. Tested very well. He's agile, big, strong. He's got a good frame. Like you see, he can command the outside where he needs to be. He understands how to use the sideline. And for me, like I said, I know the whole Jeff didn't, been, Jeff didn't pan out getting the big outside corner, like you say, but I'm willing to have another go at it. Like I said, I've seen someone mock him to us like in an early draft, like at like 32, like the Lions picked up. And I, even I thought that was a bit rich. Or like, he's he's polished, but he's got a long way to go. And 40, I do feel a lot safer. Like I said, you don't need to start straight away. Like you say, you can ease him in. He may not see much playing time all his rookie year, but for me, I, I've just got a lot. He's got a lot of things that he can't teach, and I'm banking on being able to teach him the things that he needs to learn. Like you say, I, and I just really, I've watched a lot of him. I kind of like, I've been big on the Cyclones last few years, and I've seen him, like you say, good hand-eye coordination, tracks the ball well, physical ball skills, especially in tight spaces. Can be sloppy, footwork. Tackling is probably, like you say, where you'll get the biggest book bears right now. But I'd like to think he'll work on his technique a bit. A bit big, but he can be a bit sloppy in that aspect. But yeah, like I say, he's one for the future, potentially. Like I say, there are no true lockdowns. But a guy that can just physically impose himself against the bigger receivers that we do kind of struggle against, I think he'd do great against like a Mike Evans. Someone's not elite speed, but can go up there 
and play the ball at the catch point with him and maybe come away with the ball. So, yeah, I, I've got a lot of love for TJ. TJ Tampa, boys. I like him. He's not my not top of my sort of day two corner list. There's some other guys have both of them, but as a sort of yeah, prototypical wide receiver one, you can handle those big outside receivers like Mike Evans, DK Metcalf, because it seems like with how the schedule goes, we're facing him every year now. Potentially, if Christian Watson works out how to be a good road receiver, him as well. If our worst fears come true and Rome goes to, all roads lead to Rome at nine, uh, nine overall, him as well. This is the kind of guy that can match up with them physically, which is something we kind of lack with our guys right now. I know, obviously, AG loves corners that are kind of like himself, so sub six foot, but still physical guys. That's all well and good, but sometimes you just do. You just need a big hunk of meat to go up against another to cover another hunk of meat. And TJ Tampa could be that for us. Yeah, has some issues that need working on, but again, the great thing about having Carlton Davis and uh, Mick Robinson and Emmanuel Mosley here kind of is he's got time to marinate work on those and then yeah we can drop him in if we need to hopefully with some of those issues gone and then in the future there's a good outside corner for us a lot of meat chat there uh Tampa I loved his tape to be honest in terms of in terms of, I thought it was really fun um my main concern with him is he was what well, he was listed like six two over two hundred something like that, and he weighed in at one eighty nine at the combine and still ran a four five eight. Uh, now he's long. I think right, you've got a type because I, I remember how much you loved Joey Porter last year as well. These kind of like long oh, range. Um, yeah, I like I yeah. like him curve men dragging their knuckles on the floor kind of build. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I like the player. I the tape was so fun. Um. I'm not sure for what the Lions want to do if he's going to work. So if they did take him, I'd love it because they obviously have a plan. Um, so, yeah, I think he's a, he's a really interesting player. I, I could see someone maybe trying to put him at safety. All right, we're going to snake back now after all the first round picks and trade downs have been done. So, Chris, you're going to be first up for the second Oof. round pick. I thought I'd prop you, uh, prep you for that just now. You have decided to go offensive line with pick number one, and with pick number two, you flip to the other direction. Yeah, I'm getting a partner for uh, Aiden Hutchinson here, uh, Chris Braswell from Alabama. Uh, once again, uh, stacked as far as the measurables, stacked as far as the athleticism. I know he ran a four six on the forty, which, uh, but, um. You know, you don't need those guys running a ton, but still very good for a DE. Um, I believe what was his broad again? I'm trying to remember. Uh, his, mm, I think he might have done faster on the splits. I'm trying. No, 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 no. Never mind. Never mind. I'm an idiot. Uh, but like, let me get back to what I want. Like, um, he is speedy, and I think that will allow him to win around the edge. Um. Ultimately, as much as I keep talking about pass rush with him, though, he's very good at um, dealing with uh, dealing with the run. But ultimately, he's he's shown he's got pass rush moves. He can he can uh, really win with here and just one hell of a bull rusher. Just really get in there. If he if he's you put him on whoever you think is the better match on the offensive tackles. And I think he will win a lot of the times. Chris so. Braswell, people. Yeah, he's balanced. I like Chris. Like you say, he can hold his own in run support and he can set the edge for guys back inside. Like you say, he won't let guys escape out. Like you say, he won't lose discipline in that sense. And has a pass rush arsenal, like you say. He went very underrated, didn't he? I'm sorry. It just feels like he didn't get any love on that defence a lot of times because of the guys he was playing with. He felt like a second fiddle, but it's always hard him. standing out in Alabama, even and especially in the dying year of Alabama. Like it was a good year for Alabama, all the same. Don't get me wrong, but like it feels like an Alabama we just kind of forgot about. If you line up against Dallas Turner, like no one talks about it, do you? Like, and that's really <laughs> strange. Yeah, I, I like Braswell as well. Um, and the thing for him as well with me is. He can also, when we want to do the sort of five-man fronts, which we've mentioned before, 
he can play that sort of James, the James Houston one, I'm going to call it that Sam linebacker. He has experience there. So we can use him there as well if we want to sort of go in base down, sort of like more like 4 3 over stuff like you're supposed to in our scheme. You can have Hutchin, then you can have Hutchinson, Aleem, Reader, Pascal, and then him on there. And you can overwhelm an offensive line. And hopefully, as we say, he's a bit more disciplined in run defense in Houston. As much as we love Houston on this podcast, would be an upgrade on those rundowns where if we're facing the Justin Fields or whoever, Kev Williams, whatever. But Justin Fields not anymore, obviously. He's now in the Falcons, but like Kevin Williams, those more of our quarterbacks always seem to have issues against. He'd be an upgrade then, hopefully would help us contain him a bit more and stop the burn. That's like 60-yard runs that's the only highlight they can post on Twitter. This, uh, this is part of the draft, 61, 73. These two picks is where I really think that kind of is the sweet spot for defensive line talent. Now, the problem is a bunch of these guys weigh 250, which isn't really what the Lions look for in a traditional edge. What I love about Braswell is he's one of these few guys who can actually turn and run. So you can play him at the Sam and all the things that we've seen maybe James Houston struggle with in terms of dropping into coverage, doing a few other things. Um, Braswell is someone who actually has the athleticism and the explosiveness to actually go and do that and run with guys down the field. So whilst you don't want him doing that the whole time, He's one of these few kind of 250 pound ish edges, which you feel confident lining him up as a traditional edge, especially on third down. And if we're putting out a run formation, a five man front, I, I love him at Sam as well. So yeah, one of the, one of the guys in this range, I really like. All right. We're going to move this one on to Steve's second round pick. And I'm going to pour scorn on Steve. He's not here to defend himself. So I, I can do that. Um, he's picked wide receiver Troy Franklin, who might be the weakest, most ugh, wide receiver I've seen in some time from Oregon. Just is it hunt? It, did, did he break 170 pounds, including water weight? I mean, he's light. Everything that people think about Nate Wiggins is is applicable to this guy. Like he just he takes plays off as well. Don't the talent is there for me with him. I, I have seen the high points, but kind of like um, Anne was talking about with Suamata Ia, I see that with Franklin, just effort sometimes lacks, not a consistent player, but the high flashes are there. Boys, have you seen much of, of Troy Franklin? Can't say I have. This is the range where, again, I just, uh, I'm going with the flow here. I've got a couple guys I'm in love with. Unfortunately. I don't want him. Sorry, Steve. Right, Tom. <laughs> we're coming to you and uh Oh, testing my college knowledge now, but I think we're in the same we're in the same college. Uh if you come off mute. Such a pro. Uh yeah, we are in the in the same one. So yeah, as I mean, like again, for me, defensive line I think is a huge thing that's in play here, especially if one of the the D tackles fools like a Chris Jenkins, even another Oregon guy, Brandon Dawless, who's a bit of a tweener. But um, I actually decided to go corner here uh, and a name that I haven't really seen mocked to the Lions. Um, but I'm going to go for Kyrie Jackson out, out of Oregon. So um, interesting guy. His draft stock's all over the place, to be perfectly honest. Um, but he's 6'4", 194, Raz of 786. So... Not the top, top end, but a good athlete. But he's this massive, lengthy corner. Um, and I guess one of the... I mean, Robertson, I really like as a player. When you look at our division, you've got a lot of big, tall, fast receivers. And so I worry when you've got, I mean, Robertson versus a Christian Watson, a Keenan Allen, these kind of guys. And so when you compare someone like Kyrie Jackson, who's probably more... He's a lot like Iffy in terms of build when he came out, obviously, as a corner. I like the idea of a slightly more traits-based cornerback who, again, we might not be forcing to play straight away. Um, he plays the ball in the air. He's technically sound as a tackler. He's physical, which obviously has his downsides. Like a lot of these college guys, he can be a bit grabby. But yeah, a high upside player who um, is someone that I'm just not really seeing mock to the Lions, mostly because lots of guys are going corner in the first round. So... Yeah, I think I think he's intriguing. Barry Jackson peeps. 
Yeah, I agree. I haven't seen him much with him, though. The one thing I'll bite back at is just, just ask me, Robinson, what happened the last time he faced Christian Watson. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with the answer, is all I'm going to say. Um, but I like I like Jackson. And again, I'm going to like, as a sort of jokey thing, I think Tom has a type because I do remember him liking a very similar corner out of Oregon uh, last year. So I think Tom also has a type. I'm not. I can talk with my uh, obvious ACC boys. Yeah, Jackson again. It's like Tampa for me. Has the prototypical build. There is some stuff there. So I think um, if he he's got good recovery speed, but if he doesn't get the, but he has to use it too much for me. Like he doesn't anticipate routes the best, but at least he's got the ability to say the athleticism to get back to it and sort of break up the ball if he needs to. So he's got he's got the physical tools there. He's just working on that mental side. And I think that's something that maybe AG can help with, or at least he can stew under Manuel Mosley and uh, the sort of more cerebral corners we have to get there. And then, yeah, I won't be surprised if by year two, three, he's a starting outside corner. But yeah, he just needs that sort of bit more time to stew and learn root concepts and stuff to really be a guy that I'm happy starting. Anyone else? All right, we'll move on to my second round pick. And at 61, I've decided that I'm just taking Ant's favourite guys. Like, I, I came to this and I couldn't not pick cornerback uh, one for his college. If you buy into what Ant believes about these guys, it's Mizu's Chris Abrams Drain. I, I know is a hot topic of discussion at the moment, but... You know, it, Mizu had a great set of cornerbacks, and uh, it's, I think... wait, 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 hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, you're calling it Mizu? Oh no! <laughs> Have I angered like, an I, American? I... No, 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 no. I know, but like after all the Milan stuff that you guys are giving me, um, I just and I, I think I did promise sorry, last what? draft that we would. <laughs> Uh, I, I think we did. I did promise you guys last year during your draft show that we would have a class on uh, the great state of Missouri. I was and very how, drunk in my defense. I know. I know. We we already. We, I, I'm just saying that our chapter at the time was Louisville, and we were moving on to uh, Missouri, and um, I guess they like get shortened to Mizzou because of that. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, tigers are in a zoo. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if that's true at all. Oh, God. Um, yeah, so he's 5'11". He's a little light at 178, 179-ish. Uh, but he's a boundary corner. Even at that height and that weight, he's definitely an outside guy. I think you can kick him inside to nickel if you want. But I don't think that's where you're going to make the best use of him. He's also only got 31-inch arms, which, considering the height, you might think is an issue. But... This guy is an absolute scheme fit for the Detroit Lions. It, bless you. Um, he's a great matcher of, of of receivers. So when they try and release by a quick side step, he's matching them at every turn. He's really, really, really good in press man, which the Lions are going to be running a heck of a lot. Sticky in coverage, good ab ability to backpedal at speed, uh, consistent in every rep. What you see is what you get with him. He doesn't take plays off. So... You know, the no turds mentality that, that we have been brought from Dan Campbell. He's going to fit in with that very, very much. Good at stop start. So when receivers kind of vary their speed, he's able to stick with them. He times the ball really well. So hitting it at its peak, competing at the catch point, just stuff you really, really going to like. Tough, versatile. Potentially, there's a little bit of trouble in terms of flipping his hips a little bit, but it's it's minor. Um, the other thing is potentially not the best against the run, but again, I don't think it's a massive issue. I, I, it's, it's not like we're talking about Nate Wiggins. He's better than that in terms of, of run defense. He is 5'11", 178 though, and so that does come with its own issues when you're picking, uh, picking uh, playing against the bigger receivers. But really intelligent, good communicator, could become a captain of your defense if he sticks around long enough for five years' time. Culture fit, scheme fit, and at 61, he could play day one. He's good enough to play day one in terms of him being polished. He's a high floor guy. I think a theme of my draft actually is high floor guys. 
I'm going to hand over again to the president of the fan club, Anthony Fitzpatrick, to talk a bit more because you've been on the drain train for some time. Not called it that, so don't, don't, no, he's just he's he's insanely high IQ. That's why I really like him. Like I know the size and that is a concern with him, but when you've kind of got the ability to read plays like he does, read a quarterback size, it doesn't really matter because you can jump plays, you can get ahead of the play, you, you know where to position yourself best to make a play. There. He's very physical when he gets to it, and there's no waste of movement, nothing like that with him. If he knows the play's dead, it'll look like he's tailing off and he's stopped, but like, he's just so far ahead with his recognition that I, I just think he's a quarterback one in hide and he's just he's just getting knocked down by a very good class here. He's better than Rackerstraw. I will tell you that right now. Um I just yeah, his IQ brings him apart from everybody else. He's got to be great next. He'll put on a bit of weight. He'll be absolutely fine. Yeah, the run the run stuff does need a little bit of going in there. But in terms of an actual coverage guy, coverage corner on the outside, you'll you'll not find many better for me. And in a few years' time, when he's fully developed, he's, he's going to be great. And people are going to wonder why they didn't talk about him more. But yeah, I love him. I, I think he can be one of the best quarterbacks uh, in the league in history when it comes to flag football. Because um, I'm just... I'm concerned... I mean, he, he does loads of things really nicely. I'm concerned he's going to be the kind of guy who does everything right in a route and still gets beat, if that makes sense. Just, I, I think the frame is going to be a bit of an issue. He's obviously got the speed stay in phase. He's pretty smooth. Um, so he's almost like he's got the perfect skill set to be a press man corner. But he doesn't have the body to do it necessarily. So I I yeah, like I say, I like him. If he can if he can max that out a bit more, I think he could be a really nice player. Sorry, Ant. That's fine. Debate is the part of this. So. All right, Ash, so, coming to you, 61. So I have also gone for corner and it's someone that has been recently brought up in a particular mock draft by a particular podcast that shall stay nameless but I've been high on this guy since he faced off against my first round pick earlier this year and played pretty damn well and I think he is other than probably Chris Abrams drain and uh, he's probably be one of the best if not the best day two corner in the class and that is Kalen Carson out of Wake Forest this is a guy who for me is one of those sort of high floor kind of guys. He's played over 2,000 snaps across four years for Wake Forest. And his calling card, despite his kind of slightly smaller frame of uh, considering some of the guys we've been talking about, six foot, about 199 pounds, is his physicality. This guy lays the boom when he tackles people. Like he plays above his weight. Like kind of like what we just said with kind of with Chris Edmonds Drain and some run defense. This is a guy that like, can lay it on people if he needs to. And for someone who was going up against someone who's about four inches and about 30 pounds heavier than him, he did a pretty damn good job against Keon Coleman, again, against FSU. Yeah, Coleman got a sort of touchdown in the fade route. But for the most part, Carson was sticking to Coleman. And the best thing about Carson, well, other than the run defence, is the fact he's good in both zone and man. You can stick him in either scheme, and I think he's going to succeed which is maybe something we kind of need because as much as we're saying, I know obviously we're saying we're going to be playing a lot of press man this year. I'm rewinding to 12 months ago when I was heralding Gus moving to more of a zone scheme that will help against mobile guys, bring to Cam Sutton. I was like, oh yeah, that'd be a good scheme. This is a guy who can sort of weather the storms between if we're playing man, off man, zone. He should be able to play well in all of them. And if you need him to while you get him up to speed, maybe with the NFL speed, this is a guy that can play special teams because, as I said, he can tackle, he can lay the boom, and he's got this, the athleticism for it as well. The only real downside to him maybe is he can let guys beat him over the top. So if you put him against like a Tyree Kill, someone like that who can use speed, he might get beat. But how better to train that than going up against j every day in practice, kind of learning how to play him. You should learn how to play those kind of receivers so you can really learn like his one big weakness he can develop with us in probably the perfect way. So he might not be as might not have as a high ceiling because a TJ Tampa or a Kyrie Jackson or maybe some of the guys that will go in the first round. But if we get Carson in the second, there's a guy that if we have to play him come after the bye this year or in a couple of years when 
uh, Mika Robinson and Emmanuel Mosley are gone and maybe Carlton Davis has signed for a new deal. There's a guy you can stick opposite Carlton Davis and you shouldn't be too worried about him letting receivers go for big yardage. He's a guy that can hold his own. Caelan Carson, peeps. Thoughts? I really like the player. I just have no idea where he goes or what's his value. He's, I, I think he's really talented. Like I said, I just, I don't know if it's the sweet spot, if it's too high. Like I say, it's one of those where it feels like a free hit. Like I say, and our room does need bodies that are that are talented. Like I say, he has gone up against some some top tier wide receiver talent for two years. So I'm all for making additions in the corner. Like I say, we're getting to that point now where it's basically still a lottery. So like I said, I'm not going to crucify anyone with taking anyone anywhere right now. Like I said, look at some of my picks, like I said, so I, I'm all for it. I just watched one rep where he forced a PBU by spearing a guy, and I was like, well, that's a Dan Campbell <laughs> player. Love it. There you go, exactly. Absolutely love it. Right, Ryan, yours says trade, so I'm crediting you with a trade at 61. And if he didn't do it, you didn't do it. Yeah, didn't trade, but 61. Like I said, I'm going with safety. Because oh, okay. I still, I think we need a safety. Like I said, I am taking Jane Hicks, the strong safety from Washington State, here oh, yeah. at this pitch. 6-1, 215. Like I said, rotational offers lots of versatility. And that might sound like Brian Branch, but I can see them playing. I can see them being on the field at the exact same time. He's bigger. He's tougher. He's more physical in that aspect. Like you say, he uses every bit of that height and weight behind him. Like you say, he's got fantastic ball skills. Incredible production at Wazoo in the last few years. Like you say, he has got a real nose for the ball and understanding routes and root concepts. So I think he'd be a great addition to our defensive back room. Like I say, we have, we've got to reload at a position where I still want to see two, three guys on the field at the same time. Like I say, we did lose uh, Johnson. We lost uh, yeah, Tracy. So we could do with another body there. And I think he's very worthy of this position. Like I say, his production, like I say, what he can translate to the next level. For me, it says someone, I don't know who or how, but he feels like an immediate starter. Maybe it's a bit of a luxury and we don't need him, but. I think I'm going to take the gamble on it and, like say, give Glenn another toy, just another tool to work with. It could be super fun addition. Jaden Hicks, boys. I haven't seen any of him myself, I have to say. He is someone that's getting a lot more buzz in the last couple of days. I know, I believe it's oh God, one of the aggregators, that nation aggregators have been tweeting out about him because he's uh, having pre-track visits Top thirty, whatever, top, whatever your kind of is, you want to call them these days. Whatever it's got, it's called. I think we've seen the Vikings today or tomorrow. Like this is a guy mm. who is, he's got the production, but now because of some of the testing, I know he ran quite well in the forty. He's sort of risen up media boards over the past couple of weeks since the combine, and now since he's getting that interest, he's a guy that's been spoken about the last couple of days. I like him, like, it, like, and agree we need a safety because as much as I love Kirby. As much as if he played well at the uh, second half of the season, we don't have that much there else. Like we have Brandon Joseph as our safety free, and as much as he was good at Northwestern, can we really trust him in free uh, free safety sets, which is something we would like to do a lot? There's issues there. We need another body down. I know again, crediting Detroit Lions podcast here, what the I think it's the mock draft they put out yesterday. Supposedly we are sniffing around the veteran safety market. I still want something there, just another rookie, even if it is you start him on special teams and then work him in. Just something there, just have a future plan there because, as much, again, much as I love Kirby, when we're going two weeks' time, I'm probably buying a jersey with his name on. If he doesn't sort out his issues, we might be moving on from him in a couple of years. So we need a succession plan there. If if he doesn't work out, we need a succession plan there because the veteran guy's only going to be here for one or two years. We need to, again, have this convey about it, these positions where if things don't work out, okay, yeah, we've got this guy we can plug in who's cheap, keeps the cost down when we, if and when we sign extensions to Penne, to Amon Ra, to Goff, to Aleem, Jamo, when that comes around, it just keeps the team ticking over. 
All right, we'll move to 73, and we would snake back round to Ant, but Ant has decided to trade. So we're going to wheel back to you when your pick comes up. We're back with Ryan at pick number 73. If I say this is a wide receiver, I can imagine a few people can probably tell who I'm going to say because this is my bias pick. I said, this is a guy that <laughs> oh, right yeah. now, this guy is hot property. Pro day, combine, tore it up, stellar season. It's my boy, it's number one, it's Ricky Pearsall, wide receiver, Florida. I say he firmly in that position now of like sitting going between like 60 and 90. Could have put him at 61, but I thought, no, that's fine. Ricky, I say 6 1, 2 10, stellar year at Florida. I say Graham is his favorite weapon. Tested off the charts, like I say, the broad jump, the calm. He was up there in like top five of like the receivers of the combine. Like I say, stellar body of work, such a hard work. Like I say, he is a coach's dream. Like I say, I know from ESU when I was a fan of the Sun Devil, he'll always be one of them guys. Like I say, what the Lions need a receiver. Like I say, we have got the heavy lifters. We've got the big splash guys. We've just lost the the reliable, safe pair of hands across the middle. Like I say, the chain mover, the guy that's capable of the spectacular. That's Ricky. Like I say, we don't need, I don't need to throw a big when we've already got the guys here, like I say, that can do the heavy lifting and make splash players. I need a guy that I can trust to be there. Hands like granite, contested catches, great route running, crisp, short, sharp cuts. Turns on a dime, like I say, he has got it all, like I say, in a strong, muscular, compact figure. And he is a damn good blocker in the wrong game. He does not fear engaging anybody. Screens, bubble screens, get him on out there, like I say. He'll lock guys up. He'll drive them five, ten yard downfield, like I say. Uh, like I say he, he is my my second favourite player in all the draft. I know it's biased, being a Sun Devils fan. But I've been preparing this moment for years. I knew he would make plays on Sundays. And the highlight catch that he did for Florida this year, that one-handed catch that everyone saw, like, that, you don't get them weekly, but that's just kind of something Scott Cable, like you say. Hands like glue. And I think this is just that sweet spot where you pick him up. Like I say, potential, like I say, to just start straight away. He's your wide receiver three. Grows into a role. Or, like I say, he just has a long, steady career of being that that second, third option. Can play him inside, can play outside. Put him wherever you want, like you say. He's got speed, athleticism, and he's got the numbers to back up over last year as well. Very productive in some sketchy offences. He has managed to stand out still. We're going to throw this to the most biased member of the show, the Florida <laughs> State fan. You love Ricky Pearsall from Florida. I'll just say that again. Yes. Florida State fan, liking a Florida prospect. And I wouldn't emphasize this point so much if I didn't know how much of a homer you are. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, you say that, but you know, I do allow myself one I, one gator like per year. Last year, it was Anthony Richardson, as uh, we all know. This year, it is Pearsall because, yeah, I've seen him for the past two years go up against my team twice a year, and he looked pretty good. Even la uh, like I said, last year, where it was Richardson's last game and they just had a second half meltdown because he had receivers just running into each other, not doing the right things. Pearsall really shone in that game for a team that looked absolutely dire in their first year under a new head coach, didn't know what they're doing. He looked good and it was the same this year. And not to disparage ASU too much either, like I can say it the same with Johnny Wilson. They weren't great on offense as well, but the fact he stood out again and again on these bad teams... He showed the promise. Yeah, he might not be the biggest burner in the world. Maybe, yeah, his agility might need a bit of work so some of his cuts aren't the best. But as Roy said, great catcher, doesn't drop much, fights through contact. And when uh, other than the cuts and that, he's really damn good at route running for someone who doesn't shine that much in terms of like the wide outside stuff. But you see, yeah, if we took Pearsall, I would not be displeased at all. And he would fill that Josh Reynolds role perfectly. So, yeah, this is my one time I allow my uh, per year, I allow myself to put aside the Knowles hat and sort of be like, yeah, that's a damn good player. Anyone else for Ricky? All right, we'll move this on to a pick that myself and Ash share at pick 73. Mm. We've gone with the same guy. So, Ash, talk about guard Christian Mahogany, will you? 
Yeah, so this is another guy. You can you can tell I really know and I really love my ACC guys. I am completely biased in that way. But yeah, Christian Mahogany, maybe not the highest profile of the guard prospects, but for someone who started for three years on Boston College's O-line, they do churn out some really damn good offensive linemen for how bad they are. So obviously the big name from them was a couple of years ago. Was it last year? Zion Johnson who obviously went to the charge has been a great guard for them. He's kind of the next one up on that offensive line. Like we're talking first year was kind of bad, but this past two years, pass blocking both above eight, uh, 80 grades. He's a guy you can plug in on the interior. I think he's played a bit of centre and both guard spots in college. This is a guy that yeah, you can just plug in and if it does come that Ragnar needs to take a game out, so we have to put Grass, uh, Graham to uh, centre, you can just slide Mahogany at left guard and we shouldn't have much drop-off. This is your kind of safety net now where you've got your starting guys and yet now we don't have to fall back on Arasuka because as much as Arasuka has been decent, it's again one of those where maybe he's overperformed his stock because we've got to remember this is a guy we picked up off the Eagles practice squad. Now we're replacing with a Boston College Eagle and he's a lot safer. Yeah, he might never turn out to be the top guard in the league, but if he's your sort of Graham Glasgow guy where he's reliable, you know what you're getting, and he's going to be steady for you, that's a pretty damn good pick for me, uh, in my opinion, at this range. I think for me, we are reimagining the Mr. Nasty pick because Christian Mahogany is that guy. And I just think unlike the last person who inhabited that pick who got drafted in that range, that this guy is actually going to turn out to be that guy. And I'm actually more bullish on what he can be at the next level than you are, Ash. I think he could be one of the best guards in the NFL. And actually, I think you find that a lot of really good guards in the NFL get drafted in this sort of range and really just rise up because they are undervalued as interior guys on the offensive line. But he is just... Do I have to say that word again? Nasty, but like he will just finish people. Um, he's he needs to learn a bit more balance in his sets because sometimes the more polished rushes will will get to him because he won't quite be he'll be over his feet. But it's the only thing that I can think of really where I don't like him. I do wonder if the injury, the ACL, he did. 18 months ago is is still factoring into his equation, but he's been roxing up boards. When we started this process about three months ago, he was borderline undraftable. Like, he was borderline 250, 220, and suddenly he's been talked about as a solid day two pick with upside. So, like, he's one of the guys who's risen the most in this process, and, and I know that you've been on on Christian Mahogany as well as as uh, a pick, along with a couple of guards. But he's one of your guys, right? When the hell was he an undraftable project? No, I, I, I guess not undraftable. That. His 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 consensus he's, he's, grade was there. Like I say, you you don't like to helmet scout too much, but again, with sort of the Boston College offensive line prospects, you know, you've got Chris Lindstrom and Zion Johnson who've come from there. One's the highest, one of the highest paid guards in the league. One is going to be pretty soon. You know, it's a system that you can trust to provide these guys, and they're intelligent. They are nasty. They and to be honest, he was part of a very good, uh, well, a much improved offensive line last year, which kept Castellanos upright. And Boston College started looking good again. Um, you know you're going to get a good level offensive line prospect from Boston College. And this is this is no different. He's another who, he had like some major, major offers from big Power 5 programs and turned them down to stay there. And I must admit, I do tend to like to go towards those guys who stay loyal to their programs, even if it's the harder route for them. Um, you say, he could have gone somewhere else, maybe got a bit higher up in the draft. No, he chose to stay there. He's going to be a great player in the NFL, so... Yeah, like, I love. I only don't talk about him because I love Haynes so much. Like you can't take them both. So, uh, but he, he's he's a great player. Moving on to Tom's next pick, and you're very much in a in a similar position. Yeah, and you saying you can't take two guards because you know, well, not not round one and three. Whoa. Um. <laughs> anyway, no. So, Brad Holmes has taken the. 
in each of his drafts, he's doubled down on a position. So 2021, he did it at DT. Reduced the impact of Levi suffering the injuries, obviously, with, with Aline coming in. 2022, he paired Hutch with, with Josh Pascal, which obviously he hasn't really exploded yet, but it doesn't matter because Hutch is tearing up. And so whilst these two aren't necessarily traditional guards, I think both of them have versatility and obviously the first round pick. And then this guy, um, what we talked about earlier, I think you've really got to restock the depth behind the offensive line and plan for the future. So we're going to go back to the well, a guy I, I really like and don't think is talked about enough it is Dominic Puny out of, out of Kansas. Um, 6'5", 3'13", 8.08", Raz. So he's an older prospect. Uh, he spent four years at Central Missouri, uh, finished up at Kansas, um, has played tackle and guard. But I think he, a bit like Graham Barton, I think he actually has versatility to play all five positions. I'd rather not have him at tackle, but there is some versatility there, especially on the interior. I, I love his athletic profile. So he is not going to win any 40 yard dash races anytime soon, but he's got a 4 4 shuttle, 99th percentile. He's got a 7 4 7 3 cone, 95th percentile. He can work both man and zone concepts. And something we've talked about with a lot of these guys, he is a finisher in the run game. So really like him as a player. I think this kind of value is nice. I don't care that he's older, to be perfectly honest, especially on the offensive line. So yeah, like like him. Thoughts on Pooney, fellas? I think he's a great option on day two. Like you say, I would... Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even consider him a tag from Alice, but like you say... I, I could see double dipping on guards. I say, it makes a lot of sense this year. Like I say he's a good offense. Like I say Kansas much vastly improved in recent times. Like I say they're they they've really kicked up a notch with some of the talent they're providing. So yeah, I, I like him. I think he offers a lot of value at this position. That's one that we like to do. All right, Steve has gone for safety. Kalen Bullock, who I know nothing about. How about you, fellas? I know him. Like I say, he's it's been some splash players for USC. But I'm also, I'm aware of Bullock. Yeah, tell us about him, Chris. Ah, <sighs> I mean, he's a big dude. He's very big. Um, there is. Look, I mean, I I, I shouldn't have said anything because now I am forced to talk about USC's defense of the past year. And um, I get to tell people, and there you go. That's it. No, no, no. It's worse. It's worse than it's worse than awful. It's worse than awful. You have to understand that USC didn't even practice tackling. Um, <laughs> you did. Uh, uh, um, uh, Lincoln Riley does not believe in full contact practice for his defense. I'm not making that up. You want to know why they were having so much trouble tackling last year? Like it, it's for that. Like soft doesn't even begin to describe the USC defense. And um, I, yeah, I mean, he's, he's got some good ball skills. He could, he could pretty very well excel in coverage. I'm just this, this crop of USC defense scares me a little bit. I'm hoping his talent makes up for it. All right. And then Chris, we're going on to your own pick at 73. And maybe you've been listening to Eric Schlitt. <laughs> Um, a little bit. I, I do. I do listen to Eric. I do try to listen to Eric. Um, this was also, though, me again, realizing I, I know I'm getting a bit into needs here, but um, you want to talk about the what the Lions do at corner. Renardo Green, Florida State. I can. Uh, yep. There's Ash's reaction. I knew that would happen. <laughs> um, I love this idea that if you're not going to have top lockdown corner, I mean, uh, uh, talent at corner, which the Lions do not in the Cam Sutton situation puts them behind the eight ball no matter what they do. You should go for guys who I know will do well in press. And I like Renardo Green as a press corner. Like, I think that is something he excels at. I know he plays. It, it, it's more zone than man, I believe. I think I don't have my notes mixed up on that regard. But at the very least, um, I want a guy who's going to be active in when the when the Lions do decide to start bringing the house, so I I, I like Green in that regard. Come on, Ash, tell us about Renato Green. I do love it. I love both the corners in this year's drafting roster. Him and then Jerry and Jones, who I think is fairly being sliding as a slot corner. But Renato, 
former safety, moved to corner for us a couple of years ago. I think it's the start of last season when we uh, had to have a bit of a shake-up back there. We are mostly a zone system. Basically think about how the Lions defence was at the start of this year. You're pretty damn close to what Adam Fuller runs at FSU. But yeah, Green is so good in press man coverage. Like Just watch week one against LSU last year. Yeah, he got beat a couple of times, but for the most part, he was sticking to Nabbers. He was sticking to all these LSU receivers and making life hard for Jaden Daniels. Does uh, it, He does have some downsides, so the speed, not the greatest. It's kind of average, but it's just, it's, it'll be good enough to get by. You're not going to, it's not a tease table situation where he's just going to get beat deep all the time. And he's not a shy tackler, but because of just the way he is, Sometimes if he, he just dives in and does miss quite a bit. So he's an enthusiastic tackler, but the way he just favours some uh, his bot like sort of low body springing into things is going to get him in trouble in the league. And then when receivers cut on him on breaks of roots, sometimes he can get a bit, bit grabby. Unfortunately, I hate to rag on Brian Branch, but kind of think of all the third down holding flags that Brian Branch got. That's what you're going to get with Green. But yeah, Green could legit be a really damn good cornerback too in the league if he's given the right sort of coaching and is allowed to sort of ease his way in. If you dump him in, so I keep saying, he's probably going to lose a lot of confidence because he's obviously played with a damn good defensive line at Florida State with Jared Verse, with Jermaine Johnson, who was just about there with him, with Braden Fisk, with Patrick Payton, who is going to be a damn high pick if things go well for him this year. He's had really good defensive line to help him and to be honest, really good linebackers to sort of cover the middle of the stuff. So all he's had to really think about is those outside receivers. But you stick him on those, like he could handle a pretty decent wide receiver too for most most teams in the league if you give him the right preparation. So I love the pick. I would I would I wanted to do it myself and wanted to force it, but I was like, I can't force just getting FSU players at every pick, unfortunately. All right. We're going to move on. And Ash, you've picked up uh, a pick here in the trade down, I think, from 29 to 32. So you've got a pick at 95. Yep. And this is going to be a guy that's familiar to listeners of the podcast because it's one of my offensive line crushes. Because, yes, I'm doubling down at offensive line in this range and I'm picking the tackle out of Notre Dame in Blake Fisher. So this is the guy I profiled a couple of weeks ago who I said, whatever you think the the, uh, the um, Oklahoma tackle is, is Jalen Guyton. Whatever you think Jalen Guyton is, Blake Fisher is that with a higher floor because Fisher is very athletic, played mostly right tackle for Notre Dame, but for me can play tackle guard on either side, frankly. Damn good run blocker. His pass sets are actually quite good for someone who's kind of unappreciated. But because he's new to the position, he's only played, like, really started one, one and a half years worth of snaps for for the team. He does have some refinement needed to do, but as someone you can start this year as your sort of six offensive lineman, the Dan Skipper role, get him on run downs, work him in that way, and then teach him the sort of pass sets, which I have 100% faith that our coaching staff can do. If we do choose to move on from Decker at the end of his contract, and we do choose to flip Penne to the left uh, left tackle position, we can just slot Fisher right in, and we honestly won't have too much drop-off, in my opinion, in terms of the overall line play. Of course, Fisher is never going to be Penne, but he's going to be at least a top 10, 15 right tackle in the league if things go well for him, if we treat him right. Of course, like I say, this he could turn into the next Andre Dillard, and I'll have egg on my face, but I think that this range, 95, you're getting sort of the end of day two, comp pick territory. We've seen what Brad likes to do here in this kind of range. Ify Melafonwu, Kirby Joseph, um, the D tackle who's never forget that I feel really bad to, that I forgot his name that we took last year. He likes taking these sort of athletic flies, position, future positions in need, let them marinate and see what we can, can happen with them. I think Fisher fits that mould for us at this range. Yeah, I like Fisher. Late bloomer, as you say. Or oh, let's say not he's had recent playing time. Audric Estime like to run behind him in between the tackles. He was great forcing holes. Like I say, can pull, can seal, can do traps, anything power inside, like you say. He was a big old back and he was able to force some large holes for himself. 
I'm certain I think he's a good plan potentially long term at tackle. Like I say, we don't have an issue now, but like I say, it gives you the option of when the time comes, do you open it? Because you've got maybe a guy to slot in at right tackle. Like I say it makes that decision a little bit easier if it does come to it in the end. So yeah, I'm fine with picking him, like you say, offensive lineman from Notre Dame. Usually fairly solid. Let's like say he's got high floor, good base. And yeah, he's got a lot of time to gel potentially, so there's no pressure on him anytime soon. Anyone else on Blake Fisher? All right, we're going to move on then to Ryan. You also have a pick from a, a trade down, a number 78. Oh, I'm swinging for the fences here. This is, this is boom or bust. This is the small school chop Robinson. This is Jalix Hunt. The outside linebacker from Houston Baptist. Six foot three, two forty five, a former safety. I say understands coverage. I say absolutely he's just destroyed this offseason. He is athletically gifted off the charts. I say he tested incredibly well. Has like a seven feet wingspan. Guy's built like a condor, I say, and he's absolutely jacked on the outside. He's got I think he should have stayed in college. I think he would have got picked up and done really well at a bigger school in the portal. He could have had that one year and you'd be talking about him a lot more next year. But he's banked to himself. It's that old thing, like, you hate the word raw. Like, this this kid, you don't get much raw. You see, he's got crazy traits, speed, pass rush moves. He's just had a limited opportunity and window to use it against lesser opponents. But he could be the steal of the draft. I said, if things click and things right for him, he said, I absolutely love him. I said, if this kid was a blank canvas and stood still for like more than 10 seconds, like he'd have Banksy graffiti on him. He can do whatever you want with him. I said, he could put him wherever you want. I trust him to run support as well. He can tackle. I said, he's got, he wraps up, he's physical, he's strong. I said, he's got a good base. I said, he can win without using speed. He can develop his own moves. I said, understands coverage. If you're going to drop him into coverage, drop him, not James Houston. Form safety, he does understand leverage and what he's seeing in front of him and which shoulder to look up. So, yeah, he has got the whole package and you could use him in a dynamic number of ways, multiple fronts, weak side, strong side linebacker. You could just throw him over the field, like I say. Like what teams wanted to do with Micah Parsons could try to do it with Jalex Hunt and it could very well succeed in the same way. So, yeah, I think this is way too high. If I'm honest, like I say, he's penciled in as a day three, but I know someone is going to reach for him and they're going to reach high because, like I say, what he could be. So, yeah, I'm just going to take a punt and then, like I say, he could turn out to be an absolute gem. What what pick did you take him at? 78. Oh, I'd love it. He's he's my next pick. So just to follow on from you briefly, uh, like it, you mentioned he was a safety. He was recruited as safety. He was a high school yeah. corner. He used to play corner yeah. and wide receiver. I'm um, just everything we said oh, earlier about Braswell. He is the guy who you can actually have playing the Sam and you can trust going into coverage. I mean, he's one of my favorite players in the draft. I knew nothing about him until I watched the combine. And I was like, who is this guy? Just watching him move around. I was like, he, he looked completely different to all the others. I'm there to watch Latu, who obviously is really smooth, and and some of these other guys. And I just I I needed to look him up. So Super fun player. I mean, he's got bend, he's got burst, he's got everything. He's he's like that kid who didn't grow when the rest of the other kids grew. So he had to learn just to grit it out, even though he was smaller, which is I, I assume how he played as a safety. And now he's 250 pounds, six foot four, and he's just like beating people up. So I don't think he's ever gonna be a force in the run game, but he plays probably bigger than his size still. He and yeah, I just love everything about it. He could be out of the league in two years. Like you're completely right. He's he's boom and bust, but I just think he's he's super super exciting. Right, moving on. Ant has waited very patiently because of the trade down, <laughs> and after being the first guy in round two. But you now have back to back trade down picks, and then you will be first up for one sixty four as well. So get used to speaking because you are up at eighty four. Try not to get bored. Um, so yeah, I traded from <laughs> Sorry. 73 with the... St this has been my, my favourite trade to do. So with the Steelers, I give up 73. I get 84 and 119 from them because I'm going to fix my defensive line. And 
I believe this is the point. This is the point in the draft where I lose people in terms of mm. my mock draft and its validity. And and as Chris says, it's going to sound before the show. It's going to sound like I'm talking out my ass. I'm not. I do have good reasons for this, but hey ho. So at 84, I am taking my <clears throat> defensive version of Christian Haynes. So for me, this guy came up on my radar late last season. He's absolutely smashed the off-season process. And then I was very lucky enough to speak to someone recently, me and Ryan were, who's seen him in the flesh. And the first three words out of his mouth when he described this guy were, Lord have mercy. And that kind of sealed it for me. And this is probably going to be way too high for a lot of other people. But I am taking Christian Boyd the defensive tackle from Northern Iowa at 84. He has a ton of top 30 visits coming up. The guy is going to be, and, and with his D-tackle class being bad and Sweat's just been arrested, which isn't going to help, I think his services are going to be rendered sooner rather than later. So, as I say, it's an FCS guy. He's from Northern Iowa. Before anyone starts helmet scouting this, Northern Iowa three years ago produced... Spencer Brown, who is the current starting right tackle for the Buffalo Bills. Two years ago, Trevor Penning, first round pick by the Saints. It's not quite a work for him there, but this is a legitimate FCS program, especially with its trench guys who create NFL level talent. And why do I say he's like the defensive version of Haynes? Because he's got the same problem that draft analysts have with Haynes, shorter arms. So people go, oh, well, he's got short arms. He can't do anything at the next level. But the trouble is, he can. Why? Because like Keynes, very technically proficient. And if you're going to be in this DMV draft, he's violent. Strong, powerful, aggressive trench player, specifically against the run. This is a guy who can anchor up split double teams. Or if you get him one-on-one, he's got great lateral ability to just quickly shoot gaps, take a running back down in the backfield. Got like 28 tackles for loss in college, 10 sacks. Most of that's been in recent years as he's been developing there. But this guy is so explosive off the line. He is highly athletic. I think he got an unofficial 9.9 Raz. And yeah, I know I'm the last person to go Raz, but you know, sometimes I've got to use it to back up my uh, things here. But as I say, he's built like a chunk of steel, like the guy with his upper body strength, like I say, his anchor. But again, you mix it with speed. For me, and, and this is why I really like him, he's a more athletic version of Aleem McNeil. When I was watching him, the more I watched him, and everyone knew how much I loved Aleem coming out of college, he is Aleem, more athletic, and with the same pass rush upside, what we're going to see, and I think we're going to see a similar career trajectory where he's going to come in, you can play him from the one tech to the three tech because he's very versatile. You play him all along that interior because he's done it in college. He's very experienced at it. And the best part was he went to the Shrine Bowl and he absolutely, in words, obliterated everybody he came up against, including the best of the Power Five opposition that went there. Because again, strength of schedule, etc., is going to come <clears> in <throat> as a negative against him. But for me... He is going to be absolutely great. He's just pure brute aggression. Another guy will bring it against the run. We've just brought in DJ Reader. We've got Aline McNeil here. Guys who he can learn from, hone his craft, and it's going to be great. And if we are going to have a problem with Aline in 12 months on a contract, it's going to be one of the guys you can potentially bring into the But we still need a DT. This is why I'm quite happy if I don't get Jazane in my draft. I just absolutely love him. I think he's going to come in, make an instant impact against the run. He's going to give you that sort of devastating guy who can get in really quickly. He's got the athleticism. Aleem doesn't particularly. I really love Christian Boyd. So I'm going with him for my defensive tackle first off. And like I say, he's got the perfect mentors here to develop. And then what I'm really, really going to sell. So hang on. I've just lost it. I'm picking him up 119. I think I've got him at. Is it 119? I pulled the other one off. Yeah, so I'm going to go for my edge at this point. And this is going to come back to the whole Chuck Robinson debate and stuff earlier. I think this guy's going to be better at the next level, not because he's as athletically gifted, but because he has what Chuck doesn't. Full arsenal of weaponry to use. I'm talking about Javon Solomon. He is the edge from the Troy Trojans, a team I have watched a hell of a lot of these last few years. 6-1. 246 pounds, which immediately raises question marks. Um, But he is 
He's my 2024 champion of my skill beat size campaign, which I'm always on about here. He's the 2023 FBS sack leader. He's coming off a 16 sack season. Broke the school record that was held by one OC Umeniora, who of course we know over here, OC, part of the OC and Jason show. A little bit of British for you there, but he's the best technical edge rusher in this draft after Liatu Latu, who I believe is just in an absolute class of his own. The IQ he plays with is top notch. And again, he's versatile on the line. So with him being smaller, got to find more ways to beat tackles and different types of tackle at the next level. You'll see him against the bigger, stronger type of guys. He will move all the way out to the wide nine. Gives himself a running start. He's got great bend on him, so he can attack the edge where these guys sort of lose that strength ability when they have to get him out of position. He'll attack the edge, go get the quarterback. He'll beat them that way. Or sometimes he'll dive down inside, but he'll get them one-on-one. -on -one. He has the athletic ability to beat them. Against the more athletic guys who can counter that, he will come right the way inside. Sometimes he'll come as far as the Fortec above the guard. He'll compact them try and stop them from being able to use that athletic ability so much. And then he'll go to work with his technique, his hands, his bull rush, all this sort of stuff he has. He keeps him guessing. He basically plays it on his terms. They say you limit the space, limit their athletic traits. In a straight technical fight, he's going to beat you. Size, as I say, generates concerns at the next level about his run defense. But his run defense has been very good in his collegiate career. And this year, it jumped to elite. And why? Because he's been in one of the best defenses in all of college football the last few years. And he's been under some of the best coaches. This Troy defense, I swear down, has been absolutely locked down. Um, and they'll just, and you know, they're very highly taught, these guys. You look at the Troy prospects this year. Reddy Stewart is one of the best technical cornerbacks in this draft. Kamani Vidal is one of the best pass blocking running backs in this draft. They have this edge which is going to get them and sustain them at the next level. And yeah, I just, again, he's just a guy that I absolutely love. Richard Gibonor's in the draft this year. They've got an even better guy who's coming out next year, TJ Jackson. This is a system that's going to create legitimate NFL talent for years to come, and we need to get on the bandwagon with this. And does he have the tape to back it up, even though he's a small school guy? Yes. They started off the season with the Big 12 champs, Kansas State. Their left tackle, KT Leviston, is in this draft. He got a sack on him, a whole bunch of pressures, and they couldn't run the ball past him. They were running about three and a half yards per carry all game. So he can do it against a bigger opposition. The size, don't worry about it. He's technically proficient. He will do what he needs to to get the job done at the next level. And I love him. And I think he's going to do better than a chop. Just because he's got the build for the NFL doesn't mean he's going to succeed there. I will always back the guy who has the skill and the technique. So... Yeah, Christian Boyd, Jave, and Solomon there. My two picks with my trade. Don't know if we stop there briefly, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ash's got a trade down, but first I just want to throw to him because he's also got Christian Boyd as well. So, Ash, do you, do you want to have a quick bit on Boyd? Well, basically ditto what Ant says, but I'll just add the fact that we've met with him at least twice. So shows that we are sniffing around him. Maybe I was gaming the PFF. Uh, mock draft system a bit by getting him in this place. Like, legit, we've read I, Ants, <clears throat> uh, Ants took him where I've took him. There's his range pretty much of where he's going to go. He could be late day two. He could fall all the way to the late to, uh, 100s. But yeah, this is a guy who, again, I tr trust me, I trust Ant a lot with D-line evaluation ever since Elaine McNeil. So if we talk him up, I've watched a bit of tape, obviously listened to the interview with Coach Huggins about the Shrine Bowl. If the team's sniffing around him as well, that's someone I'm interested in. So when I saw him there at 173 with one of my trade down picks, I was all for it. And at 131, you picked up uh, some capital before. Who have you gone here? <laughs> so not only did I double down that offensive line, I tripled down. And yet again, it's somebody that we've talked about on the prod previously. Is he a man? Is he a type of pasta? Well, he's both. It's Tanner Bortolini, the interior offensive lineman out of Wisconsin. Athletic dude. This is someone that came onto my radar, obviously, at the Combine, where he blew everyone away with the athletic testing. And then you turn on the tape, and I listened to, obviously, I believe it was Rye who profiled him for the pod. Absolute mauler. What, and to be fair, what more did I expect from someone playing at Wisconsin? They produce 
good linemen. We're talking from obviously JJ Watts, the big guy, but they produce a lot of damn good linemen. And Borsellin is the same at that. At that. He's played both guard and center. So again, someone that can back up both. But for me, he's probably the long term replacement for Frank in our system. For me, we can play him at guard if we need to. But for me, that's the vision for him. You then have to then be solidified basically three of those four question mark positions in a couple of years are solidified with these three picks with Mahogany, Fisher, Bortolini. That's off an another offensive line, at least a half of it, that we can trust in three, four years' time to be pretty damn good and continue this trench warfare that we portray on the on the gridiron. Ryan Bortolini, do you want to talk about him a bit? Love him. It's perfect because he can play guard and he buys us time until Frank steps away and he slots in as a natural centre. That is an absolute mauler in the wrong game, gets to the next level and cracks skulls. Like I say, he is like I say he is shifty. He moves a lot quicker than his weight. Like I say, he has got ups behind him. And like I say, he is great going forward. And he's just a solid going backwards. So yeah. Uh, I trust him, like I say, his future is at centre. Whoever takes him is one day going to have him snap it in the ball, I'm sure. And then, Ash, you've got another trade down pick. Yeah, and again, this is someone, as I mentioned with Boyd, it's someone that I believe the Lions have met at least once. I think it was a four-ball interview at the Combine, and that is the safety out of Oregon State. And I'm not going to butcher his name oh, like because, him. yeah, like, this is a guy who I've seen a bit on tape. Admittedly, I'm going mostly off PFF grades, but I did watch a bit of him because I was watching a bit of Oregon State, for obviously, where I'm the new FSU QBs from. This is a guy that's a do it all, like a master, a master of all. Like, oh, jack of all trades, master of none, should I say. Good in run support, good blitzing, good coverage. Probably will be more likely to slot in into sort of the Iffy Malafon role as a sort of strong safety more than the. Kirby Joseph single high roll, but we can play him there if we need to. And he's just a good, solid safety free for us year one if we need him to. Obviously, I know, as I said earlier in the pod, we're sniffing around veteran safety, but honestly, with this kind of pick, if a veteran safety is kind of like, hang on, no, you've just drafted a guy, I don't want to come here, we can use him in free safety sets, ease him in, get him used to the NFL, and then if, if he doesn't work out, if we need to move on from Kirby, you slot him in year two, and you've got a good solid, dependable safety starter for the next couple of years. He, again, might never explode to be an Earl Thomas, like I infamously predicted that Kirby might be one day. But if he's a, just a good all-round solid safety for a third, fourth round pick, can you really ask for more? So this is a guy that will just at least give us that safety, that safety, and then potentially could, if we need him to in a, in a year or two, become a solid starter for us. Just for the record, for the audio pod listeners who aren't watching the picks be revealed, the pick that Ash just talked about from Oregon State, the safety is Olakitan Oladapo, who I have checked the pronunciation for. Ol- Oladapo is, is how it's said. So there we yeah, go. So just, if, I didn't want to take the risk. You know me. I mispronounce things on a daily basis. I'd rather not offend any future safeties who can absolutely snap me in half. Right, I know that we've been going for some time, but the next pick is going to take up quite a lot of the picks because myself and and Ryan McCluskey have all taken this player. I'm going to throw it to Ant because he had to wait quite a long time before to talk about this player. But at 164 for yourself and Ryan, and for myself in a trade down at 198, we all have a certain corner. Yeah, so... Lions have two glaring needs at corner. One, like I said, they get toasted on the line of scrimmage. They need a physical guy to come up and be able to remedy that. Done that with Kool-Aid. We also get burned down the field by a lot of speedy guys, and we need someone who can deal with that as well. And that's where my development pick goes, because I know the team like him. I've tried to go over guys that they specifically look into, but Nehemiah Pritchett, the cornerback out of Auburn, this is, he's a versatile downfield specialist. So, oh, he's got great deep speed to combat these sort of elite speedy receivers like the MBSs of the world who have um, like really just been a pain in our ass all over the years. Like the recovery speed is elite. If he loses on the line of scrimmage, like this guy is quick, but he's also, again, 
high IQ, the ability to track the ball, know where he needs to be so that he can get a jump on these guys he's coming up against. He's very sticky. And it showed, again, he was another one who balled out in the Shrine Bowl. He locked Tez Walker down, who got nothing against him all game. And he's pretty good. Um, can play both man and zone systems as well, which gives us versatility for our defensive scheme. But like we desperately need someone who can come in and help in that regard. That is why I'd go for him there. He's got a lot to work on. Hence why he's going 164. Tackling is eh, poor. He's a little bit of a lean frame guy and he sort of throws himself in with a bit of reckless abandon. The technique needs to get much better with him um, and his run defense just as a whole generally needs to get better. Because again, a little bit of a bean sprout. Need to improve if you're going to be on a roster for a very long time in the NFL. But offers immediate help for a secondary that is having trouble down the field, which we are whilst you develop him into a full-time starter. So I'm looking at two guys who can come in and solve some of the biggest problems that we have. And I've just been really impressed by Bridget. I didn't watch him much at Auburn. I have now because he caught my eye in the postseason process. But I think he'd be perfect here for us. I'd love it. Double down at corner and I'd feel confident going into next year. Ryan, you also picked him. Yeah, it says a lot about a guy. If none of us looked at our mocks and we all picked the same player at the same spot, I think that means we're all, we're all the same way. He offers something we don't have, and that is a guy that is comfortable, who's back to the ball. He doesn't need to know where the ball is because he understands route recognition. He can read hips, eyes, and hands, and that's all you need to know. Like I say, if a guy's going up with his hands, he knows up to go up and play the ball. Like I say, grip, ran a 4.36 at the combine, elite speed. Like I say, he, he can go, he can roam anyone downfield, doesn't bother him. He can track the ball. Like I say, if you don't get his head round, like you say, he'll wait for them to make a move and then he'll react. Like you say, great deep ball coverage. Like I say, played press as well, can jump by the scrimmage and then he's happy to bail because the hips flip really well. He transitions from a back pedal to a straight line tailing them very quickly and he's very comfortable in that aspect. And that's something we don't have. Guys getting behind our guys and it's it feels like it's already good night Vienna. Like I say, because they just don't, they aren't able to recover because they've lost too early on. I think the only thing I have to add is, so I took him at 198, which I think is a better range for him. He's a consistent guy. The only thing I would say is Ryan talks about his patience and then going. I think sometimes he can be too patient to the point of being late sometimes, and I would like to see a bit more, less thinking, more doing. Because, instinct. yeah, yeah, be more instinctual rather than, than be too processing. I mean, the sort of, plague that that hit Akuda, I can kind of see with Pritchett as well. So if he can sort that, I'm going to be really high on what he can do. But at the moment, that does seem to hurt him a little bit because what that means is that he is doing the, the same sort of thing that I saw Christian Gonzalez do last year. I know totally different prospects and totally different draft profile, but Gonzalez had no feel for football. Just he was so quick that he could react to being beaten at the line, and I can see Pritchett doing the same, because he gets beat quite often and then has to recover, and he's good at it, but it worries me, especially when he got to the next level and come up against the Tyreek Hills of the world. So I'm 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 bullish on his prospects. I took him in the mock, but there, there's some things to work on there. Right, we're at... We're not at Ash because you had a trade... So we're moving to Steve's pick, where he took uh, tackle Javon Foster, who I think has been spoken about in this uh, podcast before. But has anyone got any thoughts on Javon Foster? If he's there, this pick, I'd be very happy. Yeah. He's a very solid option in reserve. Like you say, he's a good start. And like you say, he offers good depth now and potential. Like say, he's got a big frame. He's like six foot four, six foot five. Like you say, strong physical frame. I'd be delighted if he falls this far, like you say. I'd, I, you run to the podium, take him, you stash him away. Like you say, you don't yeah. need him for now. But later on, like you say, he offers you options when you do need to call upon them. So, yeah, he would offer depth that we've not had at tackle for what feels like a long time. Dependable guys you trust to come in. I would trust him to come in. Yeah, it's a great Michigan pick. Kid as well. He's a Michigan kid as well. So, home, there's your hometown pick for the fans tracking. Chris pulling a face at that. We're going to come to Chris. It feels like an age, but this is what happens when you're at either end of the snake. Uh, you'll be first up for the next one as well. So, 
Chris, at 164, you've gone for a DB. You're double dipping. Yes. DB. Well, yes and no. I'm actually taking J. Um, I need to remember what school he's out of again, just real quick. Jalen Carley's from uh, Mizzou, Missouri, <laughs> Mizzou, the Tigers, the greatest journalism school, depending on if you listen to their graduates. <sighs> um, Jalen Carley's is actually for me a special teams pick. He was very good in special teams uh, for Missouri. Uh, let me let me try to see if I can put this into words here. He's he's going to be a project if you want him as a starting safety. Um, I think that's a luxury the Lions can take right now. Um, there might be at some point a switch he could probably make to linebacker, but the point is that this is a guy who really balled out in special teams had a very large number of number of uh tackles he played in the east west shrine bowl um i'm trying to remember i uh, i don't have his his special teams numbers up in front of me but just rest assured this is kind of one of those guys that i feel like this late in the draft with not too many options other surrounding you i'd like to take a guy who you know <laughs> Uh, not not quite the um, Jalen Reeves Mabin that you might have, but investment in special teams is always appreciated. Uh, you're not going to get a top starting safety here, but this is someone who could either develop into that while also bringing you in the interim a lot of chance to provide coverage, especially especially fascinating with the new NFL rules on kickoffs that I would like more investment in that regard. All right, and we're coming straight back to you, Chris. At All right, two oh one. Oh, okay. Um, God, I had a bunch of tabs open earlier, and now I am like struggling to find all of them right now. Uh, I'm taking a running back of all things, George Halani, who is a very fascinating uh, prospect out of Boise State. Um, didn't have the greatest 40 yard time. I think he ran like a four or five or something, but someone who's very explosive uh, at, at the, at the line of scrimmage gets good penetration uh, 9.12 RAS someone who I think like you, you look at, you look at the future lines right now, they have RB one with Jameer Gibbs and you've got RB two with David Montgomery, but this is, you know, I, I made sure, look, hey, Jeremy, I don't know if you're still listening, but I took a running back outside the top 200. So there it is. There's your <laughs> RB3 for the interim, someone who maybe takes over from Montgomery that you have under rookie control, and you just kind of take a flyer. He was a really key piece for Boise State. He was there a long time, I think about like five years or so. He's got a pass-catching game as well. Like he's, very, at this point, why not? I think I've gone very defense and, and trenches heavy. So this was my little uh, little treat on the top, a little dab of uh, of whipped cream. All right. It's up to Steve's pick, and he's gone non-specific for the rest of this. I feel like uh, with everything that's happening with him, looking at day three picks has not been a particular concern. But he is drafting not a kicker in this position, and I, I wholeheartedly approve of that pick. Tom, you are up. I mean, how do, how do you follow not a kicker? Well, this guy isn't a kicker, so on the same wavelength, I guess. Um, jumping straight to it, I'm taking Marcus Rosemary Jack Saint, wide receiver out of uh, Georgia. Um, actually, similar to Chris, we're getting to the stage now where I'm thinking special teams as much as anything. Uh, 61195. We didn't get his testing. Uh, he opted out of a bunch of it. He is a, he's going to be an underwhelming athlete. He's not someone who's going to take the top of the defense, do anything like that. But He's going to likely play the X at, at that size. And whilst he's unlikely to turn into a superstar, he is so physical. I think he can be a tough cover for any undersized guy who don't want to take their lumps. I mean, talking about the game, he said, I just love the contact. I love catching the ball. He might be the first wide receiver in history to say he loves contact before he loves catching the ball. That's what he's about. He is a dominant force in the run game, probably the best run blocking receiver in the draft. And most importantly, I think for when you're picking guys here, he has significant special teams value too. And that came through when it, when, um 
when you got the reports out of the senior bowl and how coaches were just falling in love with him and all he wanted to do on special teams. It just feels very much like a Lions player. He's not a high upside guy like some of the other players that I've drafted and know we all have, but I think he's someone who will get a lot of special teams reps. He will get the occasional reps on offense and he will dominate the guy in front of him. So, yeah. Oh, well, Tom's talking big on his day three picks here. The, 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 you're talking big. <laughs> I know about nine people at this stage of the draft. So, you know, it limits what I can do. I, I know the guys who are on the board. I looked at the at in in the mock draft simulators. I would get and just like, oh, okay, that's nice. I'll go with that. <laughs> I, I realized I actually missed out a trade uh, uh, trade down pick for myself. So just to say, I I did take a trade down, which is why I talked about Pritchett at one ninety eight. But I actually missed out the fact that I also picked up one eighty four. So. Uh, 164 in this draft with Miami for 184, 198, and a 2025 seventh going back to Miami for that. So one pick for two in this draft. And at 184, I've gone for the defensive end from Colorado State, Mohamed Kamara. <laughs> that is the reaction that I was looking for with this. Now, uh, Similar height weight profile to to a player that we already have in James Houston, 6'1, 248, 32 and 38 inch arms. So pretty lengthy guy, really high production guy at Colorado State. So he's had 32 sacks over his five seasons and 14 sacks in the most recent season. So he's really kind of improved year on year. Not the most polished pass rusher in the world, I don't think. Um, he he is a big kind of bull rush power move type guy. And I think that there could be a bit more finesse that he could do, especially since for all the power that he brings, setting the edge isn't fantastic. And I don't really see how those two things can combine. If you're if you're a bull rush guy, you should be able to set up against the against the run because it's a similar skill set. He hasn't shown that. So but at 184, I kind of don't care. I'm looking at a production and I'm taking a swing for the fences because kind of like with James Houston, if you can hit at this position at edge, then you're doing something fantastic. This is a flyer, but Ryan, eliciting that reaction is something I was looking for. I love him. Just, yeah, production. He will not win the same way the NFL he wins in college, but he will adapt. He will overcome. Right? So he will find new ways to win. Like you say, he is compact. He is like a coiled spring, ready to pop. Like says on like six one six two forty. Like you say, he's really not a lot to him. Like you say, and you don't bring him in for run support. You bring this guy in to rush the passer, and I think he can do that. And I think he can do that to a good level. Like you say, and this is where you're bringing him in at this late stage because, like you say, right now he's been a bit one, two, three dimensional. Like I say, needs to improve on the Arsenal. Like you say, but yeah, he's proven. And he's got it on track record that he can win a uh, good score as well. Like I say, no slouches, CSU. Like I say, I think he brings in a lot of upside. Like I say, and someone you can start in packages, second, thirds, downs, and then eventually, like I say, you bring in a guy where as soon as you get to a certain down distance, you call his name and number, and just goes on and does his job. So, yeah, he's very much in the James Houston kind of mold. Hate to say it, but I don't think you'll get him 100 picks before that. You'll be long ass gone by that then. Really? You'll be gone day two. Ooh. You won't a... you won't you won't see him in day three. It's a big take. Okay. We'll see what happens with that. But anyway, uh and of course I'm only saying that because it was actually my turn at pick two oh one as well. And at two oh one I'm taking someone who's rapidly becoming maybe my favourite player in the draft, which is a big Claim to make for someone in the 200s. I don't care. This is the most slept on guy in the draft. And I know that's a buzz term. I don't care what you think. Because this is Pittsburgh receiver Bub Memes. And I've talked about him in this show before. But I'm going to keep going on about him. Because he is one of the most polished wide receivers in this draft. And he was let down massively by his college quarterbacks. Now, he is 6'1", 212 with 19 on the bench. He runs a 4'4", and he has a 39 and a half inch vert. This is a starting X wide receiver in the NFL. Day one, I think he starts for the Detroit Lions, even at pick 201. So, take him. 
it's another swing. I don't care at this sort of stage. It is going to be, but smooth release, nice footwork out of his brakes, plays fast, plays big, good contested catch guy, good route runner, yak ability. He can box out people like a basketball player. He needs to develop his route tree, which is one of the reasons why he's down here. Can he do more with that regard? But the stuff he does, he does exceptionally well. That's hitches, quick outs, comeback routes, and he's also a weapon down the field. I absolutely love him. I've talked to some other evaluators um, in other places that I respect who have him at that sort of late day two range rather than late day three. But the consensus is that he's around that sort of 240, 250 mark. So even at 201, he's being overdrafted technically. And I don't care because I think he could be a perfect replacement for Josh Reynolds. All right, moving on to Ash, and you're the guy who did it. Yeah, I'm the one who took the swing, looked over the border, and saw a particular player and thought, I'm willing to take a try on that. Of course, we're talking about the cornerback from the CFL, the guy who has not played a snap of college football, yet I'm taking him here at 201, the cornerback Juantes Stiggers. I do admit he's... this is a it's yeah. Go, go, go he's, on, go on. He's, he's, he's boom and bust, but from the little I've seen of him, because God, is it hard to find CFL clips over here? I like what I see. It's it's a hundred percent a risk, it, but at this range, I'm willing to make it. I could see him going a lot higher if a team falls in love with him. And at this point, I was like, I've just got to. I've got Kellen Carson, who's my kind of safe corner pick. Let's get a guy who, if everything goes right for him, and I do admit. It might be a sliver of probability that he does turn out to be this way, but he could be a cornerback one in this league. And at 201, if you get that, God, have you smashed a draft out of the park? We talked, um, and you can still find it and download it to give me a little bit of like a few cents on the dollar. Uh, a POD cast with uh, a CFL expert JC Abbott, who covers the uh, who covers the Canadian Football League, Canadian himself, writes for Three Down Nation. Um, we talked to him about Matthew Best. We I also forced him to carve out some time about Quantes Stiggers about um, what it really means, how he has kind of blown up on the scene. CFL writers themselves do not think they will get to he will, CFL right, writers are convinced he will get drafted to the point where I think the CFL's own website had a enjoy Quantes Stiggers while you still can. Uh, headline for one of their articles. Um, his background is beyond fascinating. The accolades he has won in Canada speak for them. Speaks for itself, really. At the end of the day, there is a question of if he is drafted. You know, this is this is something I, I will I will not spoil the entire podcast. But there is a point that JC brought up that if you want Quantez Stiggers, you better draft him. Because there is certain things he's technically outside the area where CFL players are allowed to um, explore NFL contracts because it they they set their window to coincide with like NFL free agency, but the draft isn't within it um, where they can leave no fault to go to the NFL. He would still be under contract with the Argos, but I think the Argos would let him go. Um, if he was taken by an NFL team, if he was drafted by an NFL team. Now, if he was an undrafted free agent, then it's a lot more thorny. Then it's a lot more. I think the Argos might, the Argonauts might, the Toronto team might quibble with, with that particular clause. So I think you're onto something. If you do like stickers, don't wait around for UDFA. He's taking top 30 visits, like definitely check with check in with him. And he, he's got that raw talent to really work. And like CFL guys have been coming over more and more like they and the the uh, Brad Holmes has definitely taken an interest in the Canadian League, especially in how potable some of these talents are. And they took a big interest in him at the Shrine Bowl as well. There Absolutely. Was a sizable yes. contingent of our lot interviewing him. So they're yeah, doing I, they're I, doing their homework. One of the things I had lined up was to talk with uh, Bucky Brooks my old friend who covers the shrine game. And unfortunately that's been kind of sidelined, but I might still carve out some time to talk with uh, 
Bucky at some point because he's a, he's wonderful and he would probably have more than a few notes on Quantes Stiggers. This is probably the most unique story I've seen in a minute, probably since um, that one German wide receiver came over, but obviously that one didn't work out as well as we all. Um, Ritz Boring. Yeah. Moritz. Moritz, Moritz Beringer. That's correct. Yes. From the uh, Schwabish Hall of Unicorns. <laughs> What a shout out. Right, Ryan, it says that you're trading here, so I presume this was a pick used in your... I think it was used in the 29 trade down, if I remember rightly. You were giving that back. Um, so we're going to go to Ant at pick 201 with a player that I, I must confess, even as someone late to the college football scene and late to the NFL draft always, and you guys are ahead of it, it this is a player I've never heard of. Never heard so of. <laughs> right, so yeah, I do believe we need to have multiple offensive line uh, acquisitions in the draft this year. Uh, I've gone for a tackle next. Now, anyone who knows me would immediately say it's going to be Tylen Grable. It's not. I love Tylen Grable, but he's not going to be here at this point in the draft, despite what the draft yeah. experts say. He's going to be gone. And I'm not doing this to impress Gerald either, but I do believe that I want a guy, I'm going to take it here, who's got the raw... I don't want to use Raw. He's really good. He just needs a little bit of adjustment. He's going to be great at the next level. Anim Dankwa, he is the left tackle from the Howard Bison. The Ghanaian giant, he is six out, and I think he's got all the materials we need to work with. So he started high school, actually, as, as a basketball player when he eventually made it over to America. Made like 6'6 six, six and 250 pounds. He is stupidly agile for a guy his size. Athletic, nimble. And as I say, he, he started playing in 2021, worked his way into that team. He's been the starting left tackle for the Bison for the last two years. Hasn't missed a game. For guys that size, you think guys like Evan Neal or Bigger, that's incredible durability, especially for a Howard team that loves to run the football. That is what they all are about, is power running. And that's why I like him for us instantly, because I think as a sixth man on a jumbo line, a guy you can bring into the run game right away, I think he's going to be able to do a lot at this level here. As I say, Howard's run game's been a monster. Go back and look at their um, celebration ball game against FAMU who on paper are a lot stronger team, and they ran all over them. They rim behind him. He, for me, is just a bulldozer who's going to be able to be adapted at the next level. As a pass blocker, he's really good. You come up against sort of these bigger, stronger edge types, he will mirror them. He will match them. As I say, you can see that history of what he's done with his basketball training. Like The movement's very agile. movement's very nimble. I really like that. The one obvious problem with him at his size is speed rushes. And I know this got exposed at the Shrine Bowl. He's been playing for three years. There are guys who are that size who just can't deal with guys who can bend, guys who can edge, stuff like that. I think with him, it's more a case of he's still learning. Like, he's still very early in his football career. But with his size, his power, scheme he's played so far, I think with us and our coaching staff, we'll be able to coach that into him. You get him to be able to bend right. You get him to be able to get his technique right there. You you could possibly get a decent level starter at the next level. A 201, that's great. We need a guy up there right away. So I'm a really big fan of him. I've watched more of the tape since we talked with Gerald, and I think, I think there's something certainly there to be had with him. So I need Dankwa. I would take him at 201, and I would uh, get my development tackle for the next level. I think he's going to be great. And then you're first up at 205 with a guy you've been standing for all year. Yeah, he's my second favourite player in the draft uh, behind Christian Haynes. Same, maybe just... But this is why I said to Tom earlier, when Tom said best blocking wide receiver in the... For him to run into. And as a receiver, I just love everything about him. Like I say, you've got inside-outside versatility. He'll play on the outside at the next level very aggressive at the catch point, but also very nuanced with his route running. You know, again, he's, I just love every, I don't know why he's not, not even consideration. He didn't get a trip to the combine. He gets no love. Yeah. He had a DWI. Yeah. So sue me two years ago. He's had no issues since then. As it was a bona fide mistake on his part. And he had to take center role for that UTSC team this year. They lost to Corey Franklin to Old Miss. They lost to Corey and Clark to injury. 
he suddenly became the wide receiver one with no help there. And he's had one of his best seasons going. Like, he should be a day two pick, an early day two pick. Most of those receivers up there can't hold a candle to him. Joshua Cephas, you get stupidly good value here. You get a guy who'll start sooner rather than later. And I will stand by that to the end. Just want to apologize if anyone's seeing any disruption to the stream. It seems like there's an issue there, but we are still live, so hopefully all is good. Uh, Ryan, you're next up at 201. Uh, 205. 205, uh, sorry, yes. So I'm in the same thinking as Ant. I'm taking our future starting right tackle uh, as Garrett Greenfield from South Dakota State. The six foot six, 315 pound behemoth back to have a, a tackle job uh, this time next year. He'll be looking to maybe, potentially, ease out Decker before the end of the contract, if, for all we know. He's played both tackles too as well. He has played both sides of a considerable amount. So y you've got versatility of what you want to do in the future. Hatch has given up the next pick in a trade, so we're skipping through him to me. And I'm taking the first two-way player of the draft by going for safety running back, Sione Vaki. Um, I hope that's how you say his first name. I don't know. I Yes, good. Thank you. Um, straight line speed guy. Uh, only one year starting. A, supply, a surprise declaration for the draft. One of the more intriguing prospects just because of the nature of what he does in being a two-way player. I actually... In the same way that we had um, the guy who went to Seattle, why can't I remember his name, who was a safety running back, we converted. Um, oh, God, we need Kabuke. Thank you. I actually think he might end up being a running back rather than a safety. And I know everyone's... Yeah, cool. Okay, good. Uh, it's just for me that his skill set seems to translate better at running back and at 205, I'm kind of happy taking a swing at that position because... If he makes it at running back three, running back four, great. Could be a special teamer. I think that he could have some return ability there. Seeing the field, being able to interpret what's going on, getting through rushing lanes, I think that's going to really, really help. He's a sort of... I mean, he could even be described as a priority UDFA. And at 205, I'm kind of okay with that. But impressive above average vision, um, good contact balance, loves to hit. I'm not sure whether he can be it as a safety. He got good production this year at Utah, but that's a good defense. And I'm not sure that kind of translates particularly well. He's not the biggest guy either, 5'11", 210. His tackling's not the best, but he's a really tough guy. I mean, I, I don't know how to square the circle with him because he's tough, he's quick, he's versatile but he isn't the best at tackling and he's not the best at man-to-man, -man. so let's maybe get him on the offensive side of the ball. But the, given the, his versatility, I'm just willing to say a swing on him. Tom, we're up for you. Come on. Looks like the stream has actually mom momentarily gone down, but the recording is live, so we're going to push on uh, uh, to Steve's pick at the very least. You're up for your second to last pick, and then you'll be oh up first with the last pick as well. So you are deciding to double down on DB, well, oh, triple down. Well, this one is kind of, again, I took, um, let's see here. So I took a corner. We took Jalen Carley's primarily for development and for uh, his special teams play. This one is purely development and also comes as a nickel defender. Um, and that would be uh, just just depth here. Evan Williams, safe, uh, free safety out of Oregon, uh, played four of his years at Fresno State. I believe he was uh, second team All Mountain West 
and second team all pack 12 among his accolades. A um, lot of experience, both at nickel and at safety. He's a little undersized, but he is uh, he's got experience. He's explosive. He's someone you really want in the run game as a safety. He's someone who can really just run downhill with urgency. And I think that's what makes him intriguing as the piece here. This is something that you would probably take if he, assuming he makes the roster as something of a rotational piece, specialized packages to deal with the run game itself. Um, And, you know, just in case branch misses any time gives you the uh, depth at nickel corner as well. Makes sense. All right. And And then your final pick. Yeah, this one, um, I'm I'm kind of a little more intrigued at this one. So I started with the pure guard. Now I'm almost going with the, a man who has played pure center. That would be Kingsley Eguakun. I can't say that name. Eguakun. 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 Eguakun, excuse me, out of the University of Florida. Um, at this point, like, look, you're just taking you're taking projects. You're seeing if they'll make the roster. Um, given the future of Frank Ragnow, whatever that might be, you might as well just take a flyer at someone who could back up at at center. Maybe see what he can do at guard at some point. Agua Khan, though, uh, played a lot of center. Um, he's uh, spent all three years at Florida as their starting center. He, he missed some time because of an ankle injury, which is probably why he's going to be as far down as he is. Um, I think i uh, trying to think what else there was for him. I don't really have too much else. Yeah. We're, we're in the seventh That's round, fine. like not we're... even guaranteed. He's going to make the roster. I mean, we're in the final 11 picks of the draft at this point, so pretty, mm. pretty close to the last Mr. man. Irrelevant. <laughs> indeed. And Steve, he's not tripled down on this pick. He's not gone for not a kicker three times in a row. What he has done is he's uh, he's done the thing. And you'll see what I mean by that in just a second. He's gone for, at 2.49, a long snapper, because... Mm. Ugh. Right, Tom, you're up. Yeah, so 249, uh, future all pro here, guaranteed. Uh, we're going to take Tyler Owens, safety out of Texas Tech. Bit of a fly here. I'm thinking predominantly special teams again. Um, I kind of add something the roster doesn't currently have, which is just an uber athletic, old fashioned enforcer kind of box safety type. He's going to be an absolute menace on specials. He almost broke Byron Jones's combine record for broad jump. He ran a 10 to 900 in high school. So yeah, he's a freak. Um, now, he is not only seemingly a flat earther, but he went one step further at the combine and said he doesn't believe in space. It's a bold strategy, Based. but you know, all the best to him. Uh, on field, he's business, likes to hit hard, super athletic, could be some fun. Right, I've decided to continue on my theme of making Ant happy in the draft. And when I go tackle, I I do go tackle. Um, He said he's not going to be available at 201, but he was available at 249. And you say he's not going to be available here, but the consensus says that he's picked 350. So I damn well hope he's going to be available here because it's going to be a swing out of the park if we do get him here. It's a tackle... Tylan Grable from UCF. Uh, former quarterback, turned tight end, turned offensive tackle. Amazing in space, great feet, moves really well, good upper body strength. And now I go to Ant just to talk about him a bit more because you talked about him on this podcast, was it last week or maybe the week before? Many weeks. Yeah, he's not. Th- Grable will get drafted. He'll get drafted hard. For me, I really like him. It's the systems he's worked in college. So he had two years Jacksonville State, two years UCF. Three years ago, he was playing in the FCS with Jacksonville State, played really well, made the transfer to UCF, who were in the American at the time, they played in the group of five, step up in opposition, still playing blindside, left tackle, played really well. And then UCF moved last year up to the power five, where he had his best season. Three years in a row, his opposition level has increased, and he is a player playing the blind side every year, has played really damn well. Had his best year of all sorts. And again, Jacksonville State run a very traditional run-heavy scheme. They love to just ground and pound run the football. 
UCF have a much more complex system where you have to get out of the perimeter a lot. You have a rushing quarterback in Plumlee. You may also get drafted this year. He's very sort of scheme versatile for what he's gone through in college. And I say, ton of stats at left tackle, highly experienced. He's going to be able to play there in the pros. <clears throat> Again, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is about him that people don't like. For me, he fits the bill for everything I want, especially as a swing to start. He'll play on both. He can play at both sides if he wants to. He'll be a good development swing tackle prospect. But yeah, I just, I like the guys who keep making the step up and they keep performing well. It shows to me that the jump to the NFL, it won't phase him because he spent three years adapting to better opposition year on year and it's not phased him at all. So yeah, he's going to be a good pick. I think he's going to go higher than just... It, it, People get lazy when it comes to day three. They scout stats and bits and bobs, and they don't really do their due diligence with them. You'd go be a good player. All right, Ash, your last guy. Friend, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I oh, come no. to draft Caesar and to praise him. If you don't know, if you get the reference, I'm talking about the edge out of uh, Houston, Nelson Caesar. Is not spelt right, but still, it was close enough for me to make the read about Shakespeare reference. At this point, it's a developmental guy, but he does have a path to the roster because he plays that sand position. He's played off ball linebacker for Houston, but he's uh, and he's but he's placed mostly as an edge for them. He's good coverage, he's good in pass rush, and he's good in run defense, and he's pretty damn good at special teams as well. So, this is a guy at this point. This range, complete flyer, might not make the roster, might be the next um, sort of like linebacker six, Anthony Pittman role, who can do a bit of everything at the linebacker position, but he's mostly a special teamer. At this range, you can't really moan at someone if they take that role. If he develops into a bit more, that's just gravy. But at least then we've got another special teamer on the roster for hashtag special teams. All right, Ryan, your last guy, as Hank makes his first appearance on the show. Tonight. Yep. I'm finally going to make Ash happy. I've got a seven all. I have Fabian Lovett Sr., the defensive tackle. Now, this guy is interesting. Six foot four, 310 pounds. He's got 10 and three quarter inch hands. He's got hands like like axe murderer shovels. He's got long arms. And I like him because... He kind of sacrifices himself. Like you say, he's there to occupy guys in the middle. He eats blocks. He takes up space. And he's a best friend to a guy like a uh, Jermaine Johnson or a Jared Verse. He makes their life on the outside a lot easier because he will do a lot of the dirty work inside. When Urban Cookie Collective sang, he's got the key. I think they might have been talking about Fabian Lovett. They just didn't know it. Like you say, he, he will be a dream for Aiden. Or like say Jalex or anyone like that in a form on front legs, he's an occupier. You can't just neglect him. He will make life really difficult for offensive linemen and he will help three guys up on the outside to just do their thing one on one. Because he has just got these giant arms like the tickle monster. Like say one of the Mr. Men. Like say he will just hang on for life and he will just give opportunities to other guys. And that's that kind of selfless guy that we need on this defense. Like say that can might take himself out of players, but you say it doesn't look like he's doing anything. But in real life, like you say, he is there and he's making an impact. And I respect that a lot about him. Like he's played with a lot of talented guys and this, he's got a few sacks across his career. That's not why he's there. Like you say, he's there to do the, the hard, gritty stuff. Like he's a big, strong guy that can hold his own against a lot of interior offensive linemen. This roster has long been overdue for a Penasini replacement, and it sounded like you described just that, so I'm here for it. Ash doesn't like that, and I don't care. And you're wrapping this one up. I'll make this very quick, very simple. Linebacker Aaron Casey out of Indiana. Looks like a middle linebacker, an inside middle linebacker. Hits like an inside middle linebacker. Just kind of got to get it up there a little bit, which is going to hold him back for the time being. But he's one of the best special teamers you'll get on day three. You've got to give loves to special teams, put him in there, develop him. And, and you know, if you can kind of get a bit of instinct in there to him, if that develops, then he will far su supersede what you get for him. But I'm thinking special teams last. I really, really like him. He's just a personal favourite. I hope he does well. 
There is a poll on YouTube at the moment. Uh, I'm struggling with Twitch because I suck. Um, I've had to group the options because I can only do four and there's six of us and there's seven mocks. So Steve's, given that he hasn't done anything in day three, bar Javon Foster, I've taken him out of the running and I've grouped together two people. If you want to vote on the grouped mock in there, it's not the best poll I've ever done. Apologies, but do get that in there. Let us know who you think is the best. I'm going to put these up on socials. I'm going to force PFF to allow me to do all of these drafts and uh, see how we do. Uh, just throw hate at Tom's draft. It's absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> then you're grouping me with him then? Jesus. Oh, no, you drew the short straw. I didn't see him. I was wondering <laughs> who was over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to finish with something I actually wanted to start with, which is what the POD cast has meant to me. And I know Chris is here, and, and it's happy coincidence that you're here, but it's the first show that we've done since the show has been axe murdered brutally. Um, but it was... So I, I graduated in, in learning about the NFL from Around the NFL podcast, which is still great, but it's for people entering it for the first time who like the surface-level stuff, for want of a better way of putting it, who... Detroit Lions podcast, did that for a bit. Still really like the DLP guys. I think they do some fantastic work. But when I discovered Pride of Detroit, it was just a lovely kind of... When you do podcasts, you kind of get to know the people on a more personal level. It's like listening to a radio show. You feel like those people become your friends. You understand what they're kind of talking about you can almost predict what they're going to say because you gain that familiarity with what they're talking about and in that the pod cast contributors became friends without having talked to them before and then having jeremy and chris and ryan on the show and then eric on the show when he joined is has been fantastic for us just as fans so that's amazing and and the way this has all come to an end is brutally cruel considering how I mean, I don't follow SB Nation maybe as well as I should, and maybe that's contributed to all of this, but wildly successful. And it just speaks to what the guys have put into it. They are so likable, and I think everyone is saying, oh, you'll land on your feet and whatever. Me and Chris talked about that earlier, and I've talked to Jeremy about that as well, and it's like, it's just not that simple that quickly, and even then... No, it it means well. It means well. Yeah. It's just it's it's harder than it sounds. Absolutely. Um, but just the quality of the people on the show, not I'm not speaking as football analyzers, but as just people that you want to be your friend. That has been what that show has given me, and I want to publicly chastise SB Nation for a short sighted decision. Um, I can say it. Chris maybe can't say it. Not anymore, anyway. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, they 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 terminated my contract already. Yeah. Like, at I this know. point, the only things I say about SB Nation, I will watch for the sake of uh, people who I still love, who are currently still employed with them. But my ties have been cut entirely, um, mm -hmm. as I alluded to in a Reddit post. This is the second time SB Nation has tried to let me go. The first time was when. Um, it was actually by their parent Vox Media who cut all ties with California freelancers as a result of a law that went into effect back in uh, 2020. Mercifully, that law was actually murdered by uh, COVID, the COVID years. It was walked back. It was well-intentioned law, but it was uh, one that caused a lot of companies to drop freelancers like me. Um, so this is now the second time I've been there. And as I said on Reddit, this is there's not going to be a third, regardless of what happens, regardless of what comes next, whatever they do with it, I'm not going to be back with them. It would, it, I mean, I've seen stranger things. I've talked with guys who have been hired, rehired. And again, I work in radio here. So like never close a door entirely, but geez, it's going to be hard for me. It, it's going to be real hard for me. It's, um, I, I appreciate you talking about it as a radio. Cause that's, as I said, it's all I ever wanted was to do a radio show. Um, there was several things that stuck in my mind doing it. And a lot of it was to be first off um, a mentor told me that sports are supposed to be fun. Number one, 
And I, as again, someone who came up with the golden age of ESPN radio and guys like Scott Van Pelt and Ryan Russillo and Colin Cowherd and um, uh, Dan Lebitard and Bomani Jones, I fully embrace that. I believe sports should be fun. I had to stop and pull over laughing on the side of the road because of a show like Dan Lebitard's. Um, maybe it's not going to be the most granola show out there. You're not going to get in deep, but it is there to create a community. Um, so that first, it has to be fun. Second, you have to create a community because the ultimate original idea of sports talk radio always was to be the voice of the fan. Now that got lost along the way. I think a lot of people get into radio these days, do it, uh, for their own voice. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I also think that's a lot harder. And I also never had interest in that. I wanted to create something that was a voice for a community that like, you know, I get to be the channel, but it's not, it's not what, you know, you, you know, it's, I, I'm not going to be like doing this so I can jump to a national stage or something, even though I still have dreams of doing national stuff, but it's something that was always near and dear to my heart and seeing you guys and hearing those words from you, Matt, thank you so much. It's, the outpouring has been insane. I'm not someone who is used to people telling me that I've made changes in their lives or I've impacted it. But um, this week in particular, I've been flooded with stories like that. And it is humbling to and to an almost un unbearable degree. It's humbling to an unbearable degree that I can, that I'm like, I, I know you're saying uh, everyone's saying nice things, but it's like, what do I even do to that? I just, I'm, I'm that important. No, I can't be, I can't be. I, I want to hide. <laughs> well, hide a little bit more. Does anyone else have anything to say about POD? I think <laughs> Ash probably does. Yeah. So I did say this in the discord. I think I said it in the Twitch chat, but for me, I know you just said that you hate that, like you sort of make it some bearable to hear that people change lives. For me, you guys kind of did POD because I had the opposite path to Matt with sports podcasts. I followed Friday the Short on Twitter for a while, and it the first POD cast I think I listened to was I think if I remember rightly, it was the one for first Matt Patricia's first game against the Jets way way back. Oh my god! So like the start the dark the start the dark times exactly. Oh my god! Quandre Diggs was the, was the high water mark, yes. and we didn't even know it at the time. Exactly that, and Kenny Galladay forcing the fumble on that interception. Exactly. We've gone from there, and I grew to love sports podcasts, and now, God, all these years later, now I'm sat here doing something I never could have imagined I could ever do because I was always that guy at school. Kind of, I'm not the most athletic guy in the world, even though I play mm. football, as said. But I understood the game. I could sit there and watch it and understand, and I was always that for my friends at school. And it's continuing now to the point where I'm here. Like it still happens with my friends at school. We do all our mock draft, like our drafting for our fancy league every year. And I'm literally sat there analyzing people's picks. Like, oh yeah, this is a good one. It's a good scheme fit and that. Learning that I can actually do that and it kind of speaks to other people other than just people that force to know me because they were sat in the same class as me at school. It's given me this whole other avenue of growing as a person. Because back then, start a unit, I was not the most sociable person. And because of what Pride of Choice sort of that path it's pushed me on. I'm now sat here talking to God knows how many people in a couple of weeks' time. I'm going to Detroit and probably speak to a load of guys I've spoke to over Twitter and all that. It's given me this whole new path in my life that I just never knew I had until you guys sort of started me down that path where you were the first step to me being set here, being able to discuss the lines and mock draft with you over Zoom. Yeah, it's it's I was very shy for a long time too until I figured out I could use a microphone. Um, it started with radio of all things. I mean, uh, music radio in college of all things, but it was when, um, I started to really pay attention to stuff like the tigers and lions. And then I found yes, like, you know, those radio offerings and I lost and my, uh, <laughs> the guy who I was doing the DJ show with decided he wanted to focus on his senior year. I'm like, all right, let me try, let me try doing this. Let me try seeing it is a, um, it's a powerful thing. A microphone. I don't. I don't profess to understand it. I don't understand the boundaries that are involved. That breaks down about it. Um, maybe one day I'll try to write a book about it. I don't know. I. I've just. I just know that this has been my identity for a long time, and it's. It's unfortunately taking a little bit of a break, and um, I don't know what comes next with it. I'm kind of just. 
I, I'm just tired. I've been working a lot of overtime too. So this came at like the time where it's just like, I'm exhausted. And now I'm having people telling me how much I matter to them. And it's, again, it's overwhelming. And so, Tom, I, no, thank no, you guys. Yeah. No worries, Chris. I, I mean, th this is more just eulogizing the show as well as putting any pressure on you. I don't, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, but at the same time, sit there and take it. You, we've taken it for nine years. You can, you can take it for thirty minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, trust me. I, yeah. Yeah. No. Tom, and I don't know if you have any words. I, I know that, and you're not big on, on other NFL podcasts in general, so I don't want to put you guys on the spot in particular, but. Well, the, the only thing I'd say is it probably feels right now like they can take it away from you, but fundamentally, I think when you hear Matt and Ash there, what you created over the last nine years and the community you built, the impact you had on so many people they can't take that away from you. And ultimately, right now, you probably have no answers about what is next, but something is next. And you've got literally thousands of people who are going to follow you on that journey. So um, it's super shit, to be perfectly honest. Right now, it's going to be exciting at some time in the future. And you're going to have, obviously, four fans here. You're going to have thousands elsewhere as well. And we're super excited to see where it goes. The only other thing I'd say is for anyone listening, uh, if you're if you've got access to Spotify, if you've got a premium account, just search oh POD <laughs> Mega Download. I think everyone here I, has done it. I've certainly yeah. done it. I don't know if it works or not. All I will say, I is no, 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 no. It's showing up. It's showing up in the stats. I know that much from what Jeremy is showing. It's showing up in the stats. I'm terrified because it's like they've told me they will keep paying me for downloads through the thirtieth. I don't know if they intended for this to really like happen. And I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely curious if they're going to renege on it or not. But at the very least, it sends a message. Well, and we're, um, we're, we're hitting their metrics. <laughs> That's what matters here. Yeah, so. yeah. One no, last one last charge at the pocketbook, I guess. I, exactly. I do appreciate it, and I appreciate everyone, including Matt, who's also donated to the uh, coffee or Ko-Fi or however I'm supposed to say it that I set up. Um, again, humbled by a lot of that, and it's helping me make up for some lost income because I, I won't lie, I was kind of dependent on the and what makes this the toughest. I was dependent on POD cast a lot for how I'm able to live out in California, which is like a hermit, but. Um, I was dreamed of living out here. So like, again, that's one thing, again, this community has always given to me and thank you, Tom, for pointing out again, the mega download, because I, I have too much, um, I have too much shame to ask people to do that, but, um, it's, I I'm blown away by it. What can I say? All right. I think I'm going to call it there. If we have nothing further, we did, did actually have one question, which was just, do you think the Lions are more likely to trade up or back? Let's say first round. Just very quickly. 20 seconds at tops. Trade up or down? Take the cop-out answer. Depends who's there. But Ugh. over on balance things, down to get more of those mid-range picks like I did because that's where Brad Holmes cooks. And let's get him in the kitchen. Brad Holmes is aggressive. He is uh, he he falls in love with a guy and has a uh, a bullhead a bullhead uh, methodology about it, and I respect the hell out of it. I think there's going to be a trade up. Yeah, I love cool. it. That's it. I I think I think they go back in the first because Brad cannot sit and wait for a hundred picks, and he's going to want to go up and get one or two guys. So the same thing, but I guess different uh, different in a way. I'm going to go for up and back, as in he's going to trade 29 to go up a few spots and he'll go back in the seconds to facilitate that. So 61 will become 90 or something and it'll be a late late day two pick to go up to 24 or something like that. All right, we'll call it that. Uh, Rural the Lines UK... YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Next episode, it's the predictive full first round mock draft. So if you like your long shows, back to back, it's what we do. If you don't like it now, <laughs> you never will. We are going to give ourselves points as we always do. You get a point for the right number. 
pick, you get a point for the right team. And if you get both, you get an extra point. Let's see what happens. If anyone gets above like 20, then they're normally doing super well. So who I wonder who won last year. I have no idea. He's not a he's not an important part of what we're doing. Um <laughs> oh, you, well, you brought it up. Didn't have to it brought it up. Yes, it was you. <laughs> I knew it, but you had to bring it up, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Pictures. We are we are in the, the home straight though. We are what two weeks out and me and Ash are gonna be in Detroit probably arriving about now, I would suspect. Hopefully meeting up with some people. Let's see what happens. Got a hopefully a place which is actually gonna come through because I've paid twelve hundred bucks for it already. So please, please don't cancel on us. Um but if you want to meet up with us, we'll be arriving Monday evening. If you're in Metro Detroit, send a central account uh, a DM, and we'd love to meet for a beer. Um, we'll see you for the mock draft show, and then we're going to try and put out some additional content during draft week. Myself and Ash are going to be recording all the way through in Detroit. Um, Ryan Farden is going to be there. He's actually arriving the Friday before us, so he's going to be there for like nine to ten days. Um, I hinted at you may be seeing him during the draft. I'm I'm now fairly sure of this, so let's see what happens. But it's it's going to be fun. Lions International fan of the year, Ryan Farden. So just saying that, and the fact that it's in Detroit for the draft. Let's see what happens. Anyway, Chris, thank you for coming on. I know it's been a hard week and it's been a long show, but appreciate you yes. very very much. As uh, unfortunately, as I am exa I'm exhausted from this and and everything. So. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to get my personal stream going here tonight, but um, I will keep doing those through the week. Um, I need to set up a YouTube to connect to. That is like the next thing I need to do. So yeah. one step at a time. We've got a lot we need to do. Um, I need to rename the Discord and house clean and talk to some other people. And maybe in the interim, I get a working refrigerator as well. Fingers crossed. I hope that you get the person out to actually look at it for you so you can get that over the line. But anyway, Tom yeah. and Ash, Ryan, thank you for doing this with me. Uh, one of the better shows that we do is this mock draft because it actually shows quite how good we are at this. Our record for day three picks, especially Ant and Ryan, has been second to none. So looking at their picks in particular, Garrett Greenfield, Fabi uh, Fabian Lovett, Anim Dankwa, Joshua Cephas, Aaron Casey, Nima Pritchett, Javon Solomon, all of the day three picks. Look out for them when it comes to it in two weeks' time. Guys in the chat, you've been amazing as always. We'll see you next week. Ant and Ryan's college show coming up as well for the surprise TZ bit, whatever. Anyway, check that out too. Let's go, Lions One Pride. One Pride. One Pride. Recording stopped. <laughs>